Um, right. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to China's uh, Path to Zero Poverty, a webinar organized by the Friends of Socialist China and supported by the Geopolitical Economy Research Group. My name is Radhika Desai. I'm a professor of political studies at the University of Manitoba and also the director of the Geopolitical Economy Research Group, which is based there. And I'm going to moderate today's event. On the eve of the centenary of the Communist Party of China, Chinese authorities have announced that China is free of extreme poverty. It's particularly fitting that a Communist Party has chosen to mark its centenary with this deeply social achievement rather than any of China's other and many economic, technological or military achievements under its leadership. It has not been an easy victory. The hard slog is as old as the revolution itself. Its signal measure, land reform, formed the first step and the firm foundation for the long journey to bring the world's most populous country that was also among its poorest out of poverty, or at least out of extreme poverty. Uh, there are many issues involved there, as we will discuss. Of course, the bulk of the job was done by China's astonishing economic achievements of the past 17 years although some would argue it may also have exacerbated some problems of poverty. However, as recently as 2013, absolute poverty by World Bank style standards remained stuck at about 100 million. That was when the party set itself the goal of eliminating it and got down to, the, got down to business in true CPC style, hammer and tongs. So much so that some in the West, um, so I read in the Western commentary, that some wonder whether the result was worth the resources thrown at it. Local, provincial and national governments coordinated to produce a national register of poor families and then targeted them by trying to boost the local economy with more jobs, relocating poor people from inhospitable areas, providing compensation for and work in ecological renewal schemes, improving education, providing subsistence allowances of nearly 6,000 RMB per capita in 2020, providing medical coverage, subsidizing housing repairs and other contextual measures, which included things like providing training, encouraging business ventures and creating job opportunities in the poverty alleviation schemes themselves. The list is actually pretty long and varied as some of our speakers will describe. As people became better off, they were taken off the poverty registry. However, measures implemented at the time were kept in place for another five years. And uh, there was also continuing monitoring to ensure that people did not slip back into poverty. The criteria for being considered poor are not only whether personal incomes per capita are above the extreme poverty threshold, but also whether the household continues to enjoy, enjoy the so-called two assurances of adequate food and clothing and the so-called three guarantees of access to compulsory education, basic medical services and safe housing. Finally, the success of poverty alleviation is to be followed by a rural revitalization program for consolidating the gains of poverty alleviation and to pursue common prosperity while building a modern socialist country. This is a quote from one of the official statements. What is the exact scale and limits of China's poverty alleviation? What does it look like to those familiar with the statistical in intricacies, not to say often the skullduggery involved in poverty estimation worldwide? Is the World Bank standard adequate? How did China succeed? How will this success change China? What will it mean for China and the world? Was it possible because China is socialist or did it become possible because China became capitalist? The world is discussing all these questions. So to explore, evaluate and understand this achievement and to mark the centenary of the CPC, uh, we have an impressive and quite ex uh, international array of scholars, journalists, politicians and activists to shed light on these questions and more. We have a total of 10 speakers. We are going to give each one of them 10 minutes because we feel they have a lot to say. And then therefore, depending on your stamina and theirs, if, there is still, if we are still around at the end of 100 minutes plus, then we will take some questions. One note, uh, as has become usual in these webinars, the chat function is available to all panelists and attendees to exchange views. And so long as you remain civil, we say let it rip, have all the discussions you want. 
However, if you want panelists to answer your questions, don't assume that because you've put them in the chat, they will be answered. Please make sure you raise your hand and ask it in person during the question and answer session. People who have raised their hands will be promoted to panelists. Sorry, this is silly language of Zoom, but you will be promoted to becoming a panelist and then you may put your question in person. So let's get going. I'm going to introduce each speaker as their turn comes up. And we are going to begin with Danny Haifong, who will give a brief introduction to Friends of Socialist China, as well as present his views on the question on the topic at hand. Uh, Danny Haifong is a contributing editor at Black Agenda Report, a co-host of The Left Lens, and a co-author of the book, American Exceptionalism and American in Innocence, a people's history of fake news from the Revolutionary War to the War on Terror. He is also a founding member of No Cold War and co-editor of Friends of Socialist China. So Danny, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Radhika. And thanks to all the wonderful speakers who have made time to present on this critical subject, China's path to zero poverty and to the Geopolitical Economy Research Group for your collaboration. Friends of Socialist China formed out of a dire need in the United States and the West to understand China and its socialist process. A key component of peace is solidarity and solidarity cannot be born from opposition to US and Western aggression alone. Solidarity also means respect, respect for sovereignty and a genuine curiosity of the achievements of countries long characterized as quote unquote adversaries. China's successful eradication of extreme poverty is one such monumental achievement. The achievement comes amid the COVID-19 pandemic, a public and global health crisis that has led to the deaths of at least 4 million people worldwide. In addition to this tragic loss of life around 100 million more people around the world have been plunged into extreme poverty. China's effective response to COVID-19 kept deaths to a minimum at about 0.35 deaths per 100,000 in the population. But China did not stop there. China maintained its commitment to poverty alleviation and announced the defeat of extreme poverty at the end of 2020 months ahead of schedule. For some context, from 1978 to 2012, China had already lifted 800 million around people out of extreme poverty, or 70% of the global total. From 2012 to 2020, China was able to lift the final 99 million out of extreme poverty, despite facing significant global challenges along the way, including the US-led New Cold War. But what does this truly mean? What did it take to achieve this milestone? These are just some of the questions that we hope to answer today in this international gathering. In my brief contribution, I would like to begin the discussion with an eye toward leadership. Poverty is an immense social problem with deep roots in the development of political economies of exploitation, such as slavery, feudalism, in the current dominant system of capitalism. A problem as complex as poverty thus requires leadership rooted in the masses of people, leadership that can point a way forward out of a multifaceted phenomenon like poverty, which has caused so much despair worldwide. China possesses such leadership. China will celebrate the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of China in less than a week on July 1st. While many outsiders tend to look at the history of China in stages, it is important to note that the CPC has made the eradication of extreme poverty a central pillar of its leadership over the last century. Whether it was the valiant struggle against foreign domination that characterized the CPC's early activities or the massive land reform, which Radhika referenced that took place after 1949 to uphold the slogan, quote unquote, land to the tiller, the CPC's body of work set the stage for a momentous victory against extreme poverty just 71 years following the formation of New China. 
the eradication of extreme poverty would not have been possible without the deep bond that exists between the CPC and the Chinese people. The CPC has more than 90 million members and enjoys the support of more than 95% of the population. For many in the United States and the West, this statement of fact may at first appear to be nothing more than quote unquote propaganda due to the intense growth of anti-China and Cold War mentalities in the so-called developed world. But for the Chinese people, support for the CPC's leadership is connected to concrete improvements in their daily lives. There is no better example of this than poverty alleviation. China not only spent 1.6 trillion RMB to complete the project, but also sent 3 million party cadres to live and work together with the people to eradicate the scourge of impoverishment. Around 1,800 of these cadres died during their service and are looked upon in China as the heroes that they are. Poverty alleviation in China does not discriminate and all ethnic groups living in China have enjoyed the benefits of the CPC's tireless efforts to ensure that the two insurances, food and clothing, and the three guarantees of medical care, housing, and education are available to all its people. I live in the United States. The political system in the United States spends more than four times as much on the military annually as China has spent on defeating extreme poverty. Despite the scale of the US's capitalist economy, more than half a million people here are without a home and one of every two people are living in or near poverty. While China's experience cannot necessarily be replicated in the United States, its poverty alleviation campaign possesses lessons for all of humanity. It is an example of what is possible when the state is structured around the needs of the working class and society rather than the enrichment of a tiny few individuals and corporations, the dominant trend in the neoliberal capitalist world. We at Friends of Socialist China hope this event brings a greater understanding of China to the world, especially for those living in countries such as the United States, which currently pursues a dangerous path of confrontation with China in place of much needed cooperation around important and critical global problems such as extreme poverty. Thank you all for coming today. I look forward to the rest of this event. Thanks very much, Danny. And we will now go to our next speaker, who will be who is Li Jingjing. Um, Li uh, 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 Jingjing cannot be with, with us today, so we are going to play a, a video of her presentation. But let me introduce her. Li Jingjing is a television reporter for CGTN and a vlogger of great style. Some of you may have seen her work. Uh, Jingjing has traveled throughout China doing English language video journalism, providing the outside world with a ground level view of life, particularly in the autonomous regions and among ethnic minorities. She has interviewed, interviewed uh, Uyghur Islamic scholars in Xinjiang and school children in Tibet. She spent February and March 2020 in Wuhan covering China's, COVID, uh, China's efforts against COVID at the front lines for CGTN. Her show, Talk It Out with Li Jingjing, is something of a social media sensation with 2.6 million followers on Facebook. So please let's have uh, Li Jingjing. Hello, everybody. I'm Li Jingjing. It's my great honor to join this event organized by Geopolitical Economy Research Group and Friends of Socialist China. As a Chinese born and raised here, me and my family are among the millions of ordinary Chinese people whose lives have been improved along with the development of this country. And as a journalist, I try to go to all corners of China to see how the poverty alleviation project is being implemented at the grassroots level and talk to impoverished people to understand their situations. In recent years, I traveled extensively to Yunnan, Guangxi, Xinjiang, and Tibet, and I saw how poverty alleviation changed those places. So today, I want to share some useful methods that China used to end absolute poverty, as well as some stories I've personally witnessed. As many of you know, China is a vast country with very diverse geological conditions and a large population. 
that poses great challenges for solving poverty. Because each region, each village, each household has a different cause for its poverty. For example, in Guangxi Zhuang Autonomous Region, Yunnan Province, and Sichuan Province, many people had been cut off from the outside world by the steep mountains. In Tibet, many people used to live in one of the world's most inhabitable places that lacked water, electricity, and food. The varying reasons for poverty call for different solutions. By 2015, 30 years after China started its poverty alleviation project, there were still over 82 million impoverished people who were also in the most challenging situation. How to help them? Targeted poverty alleviation, which I think is one of the most valuable experiences that people in other countries could learn from. I'd like to explain how targeted poverty alleviation worked. First, people in poverty must be identified. That includes pinpointing exactly who are the impoverished people, who needs help the most, what are the reasons that led each family into poverty. Second, precise solutions. After identifying the people, local governments need to come up with specific plans that can help each household. I can give you an example that I witnessed last October in Dali by Ethnic Group Autonomous Prefecture in Yunnan Province. People who work in government or state-owned institutes in that region need to take care of those impoverished households. 200 public servants take care of 600 impoverished households in that region, and each person is assigned two or three households. I followed two young public servants that had been taking care of four families for over two years. And this is the footage I took with my phone. 这些年有没有什么这个改变啊、改善啊？改善的话，像阿哥他们也经常过来访问啊，有、嗯、些、嗯、小宝他们啥，他都给一些零用零花钱啊，这种的挺好的。嗯，也非常感谢政府他们。咱们这个房子盖的时候都补助了两万三千块钱。哦，这个房子。就是、盖这个房子的时候。哦，嗯、那以前住在哪儿啊？以前是我们三家一起住的。There were many reasons that led those families to poverty. Some had several children that needed to go to school, which posed an extra financial burden to that family. Some had family members who were very ill, costing them a tremendous amount of money. Others had disabled or elderly loved ones that were unable to work. And during those two years, officials regularly visited these families, helped them overcome difficult times, and helped them get subsidies for education, health care, house building. Even after some families were lifted out of poverty, officials would still visit them to make sure they wouldn't fall back into poverty. Third, transparency and precise management. All the impoverished households were registered in an online system. The cause of the poverty, the year they were enlisted, the year when they were all lifted out of poverty can be found on that network. At the same time, the amount of money that each family gets from the government and how they spend it is also clearly listed. And this is applied in a poverty-stricken family that I visited in Guangxi. But actually, these cards prove they used to be very poor families. It says Guangxi, um, this poor family tracing and helping contact cards. And it says which city, which village, the governor of this village. And they got out of poverty in 2017 here. And these are all the uh, government officials working this village, uh, and also this card is specifically listed uh, how much money they got from the government, and where it goes. For example, this is like uh, the pensions, um, some insurance. Um, it says where how much money they got from the government, and where they spend it. Poverty alleviation doesn't mean to just give people money. How to make it sustainable is something many poverty alleviation commissioners have been dedicated to solving. Building roads and infrastructure, providing farmers professional skills training, establish agricultural cooperations, bring companies that are interested in buying products from those villages, and most importantly, provide educations, especially for the young generations, so they will forever have the tools to improve their lives. In Guangxi Mula Ethnic Group Autonomous Prefecture, 
I saw kids of different ethnic backgrounds that used to live in remote mountains being moved into brand new schools equipped with top-level educational materials and staff. China's poverty alleviation project focuses on building infrastructure, houses, education, medical care, jobs, and protect the ecosystem at the same time. But that job wouldn't be accomplished without the 200,000 government staff members at all levels that went to villages as poverty alleviation commissioners. I have a colleague who went to Da Liangshan in Sichuan province and made a documentary called Working in China's Poorest Village. He shadowed a poverty alleviation commissioner for weeks trying to do what he did, and the workload is beyond expectations. The job is 24-7. The commissioner told villagers they can call him if they need any help with anything. And by anything, he meant anything. From repairing a broken rooftop, how to learning to better raise a cow, to addressing issues with neighbors, and for tips on properly raising a kid. Even though absolute poverty was ended by the end of 2020, the commissioner will continue to stay in that village for another year because he needs to make sure those villagers won't fall back into poverty. Those officials build a close relationship with villagers. By being fully committed to a village, many of them have to leave their own families, their own children behind. 700 poverty alleviation commissioners sacrificed their lives doing poverty alleviation work. Among them was a girl named Huang Wenxiu, who was caught in a landslide on her way to fix a pipeline for the village. She was only 30 years old when she passed away. Absolute poverty was ended in 2020, but that doesn't mean the poverty alleviation work has ended. China continued to improve the lives of people in less developed regions, working on solving relative poverty and revitalizing rural areas. Honestly, before I started my journey to the rural regions, poverty alleviation was just a bunch of numbers and policies I saw on the news and in books. I never realized how difficult it was and how life-changing it was to the millions of people there until I actually went there and talked to them. All these policies are people-centered. Poverty alleviation has always been a top priority of the government, no matter in short-term or long-term plans for the past 40 years. Improving the well-being of people, improving the life of people, has been the goal of government work. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much for that, Li Jingjing. I, our next speaker will be Roland Bo. Roland is a professor of Marxist philosophy in the School um, of Marxism at Dalian University of Technology in China. Before that, he taught at Renmin University in China and a number of universities in Australia. He has also been a visiting professor in the Academy of Marxism in Beijing, uh, that is, which is housed within the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Among numerous works on Marxism and philosophy, he has published the five volume work, The Criticism of Heaven and Earth, published by Brill. Uh, in, from 2007 to 2014. In 2014, it was awarded the Isaac and Tamara Deutsche Memorial Prize. He has recently published a monograph entitled Socialism with Chinese Characteristics, A Guide for Foreigners, published by uh, Springer, and, uh, uh, and we will soon be pub have it published with Renmin University, and sorry, he will soon have published with Renmin University Press, a work entitled Friedrich Engels, and the foundations of socialist governance. So, Roland, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you very, very much uh, for uh, the invitation to join this very, very important panel. I'm I'm going to take a, a particular angle on poverty alleviation. That's very clear, I think, from the title. And I've got a couple of slides that I'm going to work through. Poverty alleviation as a manifestation of Marxist human rights or Chinese Marxist human rights. Uh, There's a very important angle on it, otherwise I wouldn't be talking about it, but it's something that I think uh, more and more people will come to understand as time unfolds. I'll begin with this image and then explain it. How do 
Chinese Marxist human rights work. Now, put aside all of your preconceptions with, that come with the term human rights. You'll see that at the roots, there is anti-hegemonic sovereignty or anti-colonial sovereignty. I'll come back to that. The core of human right in China is the right to socioeconomic well-being. The right to socioeconomic well-being noticeably missing from the Western tradition of human rights. And then the, the leaves or the fruit are civic, political, cultural, and environmental rights. Now, let me say a little bit more about each one. First point, sovereignty, now you can call it sovereignty with Chinese characteristics, uh, as, as one form of it is the foundation, but this particular definition of sovereignty arises from the anti-colonial struggle and is therefore shared with many, many countries that were involved in the anti-colonial struggle and achieved national liberation, especially in the 20th century. And it's predicated on mutual non-interference or the term that's used is hegemony, um, that you don't seek to uh, enact hegemony, and hegemony on another country and no other country enacts hegemony on you. That's anti-colonial sovereignty. It's absolutely crucial. It's peaceful coexistence uh, common to countries in the non-aligned movement. There's two other dimensions that do come uh, from a Chinese context. One actually is earlier, is the Marxist focus on material rights. These are the rights to work, the rights to food, clothing and housing, the right to socioeconomic well-being, which is embodied actually in the right to life. Now, it's interesting that the right to life has somehow disappeared from the Western tradition with the COVID-19 pandemic, but we'll come back, maybe come back to that. How is this particular Marxist emphasis manifested? Well, it's a technical term for this, unleashing the forces of production or liberating the forces of production and attaining well-being for all. Or as uh, Deng Xiaoping put it, there is no such thing as poor socialism. There's also an, uh, an influence here from the Chinese tradition. I've chosen two. There are many other examples. This is a very uh, well-known um, saying in China. When the granaries are full, the people will follow appropriate rules of contact, uh, conduct. And when there's enough to eat and where people know honor and shame. Now, this is recorded in Sima Qian's uh, The Great Historian, attributed to a... a um, statesman from the Warring States period, Guan Zhong. You can see how far back it goes. It's uh, pushing three millennia ago now. There's another strong dimension to this, which has become uh, reinterpreted in a Marxist context, uh, the Confucian desire for at least a Shao Kang society. Um, now, Shao Kang has, has many dimensions. It's translated as moderately well off, but it means moderately healthy, moderately peaceful, uh, moderately stable, secure, all those sorts of things um, as well. So there are two elements, the Marxist and the Chinese influence on these. And you can see by now how it can be argued that the, uh, this particular emphasis of human rights underlies the lifting of around 800 million people out of poverty or out of absolute poverty. But it also underlies things like the minorities, nationalities policy, the Belt and Road Initiative, and so on. Let me just go back to the image briefly, and you can see then how these relate to one another. Thus far, let's wait for, there we go. Thus far, I've emphasized that it's a particular Marxist or Chinese Marxist approach to human rights. It's not just that. It's also a distinctly global approach to human rights. 
And I want to uh, draw quotations from two important UN documents. The first one is a short but very, very important document from 1960, the UN Declaration on the Granting of Independence to Colonial Countries and Peoples. Um, now I've got some of this text hidden here. Now what's happened? Great. All right. Sorry. There we go. This declaration includes statements, the subjection of peoples to alien subjugation, domination and exploitation constitutes a denial of fundamental human rights. So it clearly connects anti-colonial sovereignty with human rights. Any yeah. attempt aimed at... And both are satisfied. reflection yeah. oh. Oh, so why you choice up? Go ahead, uh, Bill. Continue. Yes, any attempt at aimed at, uh, oh, I can't see that text there, total disruption of the uh, territorial total disruption of national unity and the territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the United Nations. Now, this is a very strong statement. Uh, it indicates that the whole sort of colonial project of interfering with or dividing or cutting up a country or dividing its borders is unacceptable as far as the UN is concerned. You can see from this document from, the 19, from 1960, which uh, went through the General Assembly, was proposed by the Soviet Union and, and then taken up by um, countries in Africa and Asia as a very strong statement. The second one I want to quote from comes from 1976. Uh, was then enacted. It actually was developed in the 60s as well. It's the UN International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. The state's parties to the present covenant recognise the right of everyone to an adequate standard of living for himself and his family, including adequate food, clothing and housing, and to the continuous improvement of living conditions. This is the core human right to socio-economic well-being. And it's actually something, uh, let me go back a little bit in the history of this, both of these, uh, the Declaration and the Covenant, were quickly signed and ratified by nearly all of the developing countries in the world. Um, and it should be no surprise that the abstentions from the first one, the uh, uh, independence of colonial countries and peoples, was not voted against. Yeah. Okay was not voted against, but uh, the countries that abstained from it were the old colonial club, about 12 or 15 countries who now constitute the West. And the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has a similar uh, story behind it. So now I will quote from a work that I would recommend if you want to pursue this further. It's Sun Ping Hua, uh, Promotion of Human Rights in China. Uh, or protection of human rights in China. It's the best work in English thus far. Uh, the history of the Communist Party of China is the history of its struggle uh, for right, human rights on behalf of the Chinese people. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Roland. Um, that's wonderful. Um, our next speaker is Professor Utsa Patnaik. She taught at the School of Economic Studies and Planning at the Jawaharlal Nehru University of India and was educated at Somerville College, Oxford. She's one of India's topmost Marxist scholars and the author of more than 110 papers, probably this is an old um, a number, and chapters in, in, in books and journals. She has authored several books, including Peasant Class Differentiation, A Study in Method, um, The Long Transition, um, uh, The Republic of Hunger and Other Essays, which was also translated into German. She has also edited and co-edited many volumes, including Chains of Servitude, Bondage and Slavery in India, Agrarian Relations and Accumulation, The Mode of Production Debate in India, The, the Making of History, uh, the Agrarian Question in Marx and His Successors, and finally, in, uh, in 2011, A Theory of Imperial Capitalism. Her most recent work with Prabhat Patnayak, her husband and intellectual partner, is Capital and Imperialism, recently published this year by Monthly Review Press. And finally, I'd like to add that the panelists here 
The panelists here will be interested to know particularly uh, of her work revisiting uh, the alleged 30 million famine deaths during China's Great Leap, which has been published on MR Online. So with that, I'd like to ask Utsa to speak. Please go ahead, Utsa. Thank you very much, Radhika. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I spent three weeks in China in the summer of 1983. That's nearly four decades ago. Visiting several rural communes and urban cooperative manufacturing units, but focusing mainly on the rural communes, which had not been fully dismantled at that date. My interest was in examining firsthand how underemployed labor had been mobilized for capital formation in the form of irrigation works, land reclamation, greening denuded hills, and setting up local manufacturing enterprises. And secondly, how egalitarian the system of distributing commune income was. And I was very deeply impressed to see the extremely logical integration of agriculture and small scale enterprises that maximized employment and raised incomes. No able bodied person was unemployed and the commune looked after subsistence, basic subsistence. It provided basic healthcare and education by setting up clinics and schools. And the principle of distribution of collectively earned income to individual households was to each according to his or her work. But in practice, one found the distribution was according to need. In the case of families which did not have working members or two people with disabilities. China had achieved by 1978 a more egalitarian distribution of assets and income than any developing country in the world, which was a remarkable achievement for such a large population. And it had reduced absolute poverty to about 28% of its population. If we take a nutrition norm of 2,150 kilocalories per person per day, and China's poverty level at that by 1978 was about half of India's level of 56% in rural poverty in 1978. Uh, of course, India applied a slightly higher nutrition norm of 2,200 calories. But China changed its economic policies drastically from the late 1970s, really from the early 1980s. There was a dissolution of the rural commune system and external market-oriented development. And after initial improvement in farm incomes, it saw from the 1990s a very rapid increase in income inequalities and I would say also in absolute poverty, as the old system of almost free provision of utilities, healthcare, and education was drastically altered for market pricing of healthcare and education, especially in the villages. India too, starting from a much higher base of inequality and poverty than China, so very rapid increase in inequality and very rapid rise in absolute poverty. But, Governments both in India and in China have been claiming poverty reduction during the period of market-oriented reforms. Both claims have been based on using the same method of poverty estimation as is used today in every developing country and which is advised by the World Bank. So I want to sound a word of caution here. I'm sorry if I'm bringing in a discordant note, but uh, it is essential for a Marxist to be hard-headed and to look at facts. In fact, I think it was Den Xiaoping who had said, um, we must learn truth from facts, otherwise the facts will punish us if we do not learn truth from them. So there is a very serious mistake with the method of poverty estimation, which is being followed worldwide today with the blessings of the World Bank. And what is this mistake? I would like to say a few words to you on this. Um, and could, could, could we have the first slide, please, in which I've set this out? Radhika, are you handling yeah. the slides? Yeah, I'm, I'm handling yeah. this. I'll just do that in a second. Give me, there it is, share. And let me make it full screen. Yeah, you might not have uh, time to read it, and it's very small in any case. So Radhika, I'm very willing to share these slides later on if anybody is interested. So the mistake in poverty estimation method followed in all these countries is that the definition of the poverty line has not been applied in practice. In any year, except an initial base year, 
which by now is decades in the past. Now the poverty line is defined as a level of spending per capita on food and all non-food at which a person's minimal nutrition norm is satisfied. Uh, and the nutrition norm differs slightly from country to country, but not very much. This definition has been applied only in a base year. The base year was 1973 in India. It was 1978 in China. But after that, this definition has never been directly applied to consumption expenditure data in later years, even when such data were available. And in India, we have an excellent database in the National Sample Survey, which has given us every five years it uh, canvasses 1 million people every five years, and we have consumer expenditure data by levels of expenditure, and we have nutritional intake data for every level of expenditure as well. But the Indian government too, the Indian Planning Commission has never applied the original definition. So what have these governments been doing? The actual method has been to update the base year correct poverty line. Remember the base year is now uh, four decades in the past by using a consumer price index. There was an implicit assumption that this method will preserve access to the same nutrition level as in the base year, but this assumption has proved to be wrong. The method means using what economists and statisticians call a last pairs index. That is the base year basket of quantities of goods and services consumed. Not only goods, also services, like healthcare education, is assumed to be available in later years as well. And only the cost of this old basket is updated using a price index. But under neoliberal or market-driven reforms, the initial basket is no longer available in any country. And this is the main reason for the rise in absolute poverty. Market prices, pricing of utilities, healthcare, education have soared upwards in every country, while incomes have not risen to the same extent. So households have been forced to adjust to reduce their nutritional intake, uh, to cope with the rising prices of non-food essentials. So every official poverty line after the base year has underestimated more and more as time goes on, the actual cost of satisfying the nutritional norm. Every later poverty line, official poverty line, gives a lower and lower nutritional intake. And it falsely indicates a lower and lower percentage of people in poverty. Why falsely? because officially the people in poverty are being measured below a falling standard. Now, anyone will tell you that is not a logically correct method of measurement. If a school principal says that the academic performance in my school has improved enormously over the last 40 years, because the percentage of failures, which used to be 30%, has come down to 5%, nearly zero. And you examine the data and you find that the pass mark has been lowered over these 40 years. From 50 out of 100, the pass mark has, let us say, been lowered to 10 out of 100. And the sole reason for the fall in the uh, failure percentage is because the standard of education itself, standard captured in the pass mark itself has been lowered. Now, this is not a logically correct method of measurement. Or you ask any sportsman, if it is claimed that a sportsman is improving his performance in a high jump, jump after jump, but between each jump, the bar is being lowered. And the only reason he's able to jump higher and higher is because the bar is set lower and lower. Then the sportsman himself will say, this is cheating, this is not correct. So what has happened is that there's been cumulative underestimation until the poverty line has dropped to a level which gives below survival nutrition. And there are no observations because at this level, people are dead. So how will you get into observations? And this is claimed as zero poverty. Now, can we go to the next slide? Is Ravita? This is it? Uh, is that the correct slide? One, the next one? Next yeah, one. that's it. Yeah. Now, you might find it difficult to believe that this is the method that's, no, not this, the previous one to this. The one just before this, or maybe- This one? Yeah, that's the one. Now, I would like to share with you very quickly the calculations I've done with India data from 1973 to 2009-10. And it has involved 
my uh, actually constructing myself more than 600 Excel charts from the basic data to find out what the true poverty line is if we keep the nutrition standard constant. So in the Chinese case, it would mean if we keep the nutrition standard constant from the 1978 level of 2,150 calories, then the question you would be asking is what is the actual expenditure that is required for a person in village China to access the same nutrition level in later years, including by 2020. And believe me, this would be about two and a half times higher than the official poverty line. So what this chart is showing, and this has taken me months to do, I'm prepared to face any World Bank economist because I've done the basic work you know, by myself and tell them your method is spurious, it is wrong. So what the blue line is showing is the actual, what I call nutrition invariant poverty line, the correct poverty line. What the line right at the bottom is showing is the planning commission poverty line. And you can see that from 1993 in particular, from the 1990s, the two are diverging very fast. And that is because of the market oriented, you know, market pricing of health care, education, utilities that I was talking about earlier, which has forced people to lower their nutrition level. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. And, and two minutes, Utsa. Sorry? Two, two minutes. Yeah, okay. Maybe three, Radhika, okay. given the fact yeah. that this is the very important thing yeah. <laughs> I'm talking okay. about. So, yeah. uh, you know, what has been happening is that the calorie intake level is, gets lower and lower. Can we skip to the next one? Next slide, please, Radhika. So the actual poverty percentage in India, no, no, not this, the one before this. The one before this in, for India, the actual poverty percentage has been rising sharply in India. And by now, well, by uh, 2018, it accounted for two thirds of the entire population, both in rural and urban India, whereas the official estimates were less than one third of the total population. Okay. Now, you might find this very embarrassing, but the same thing has been happening in China. Now, I'm not saying people are doing this deliberately. They simply haven't understood the implications of the statistical method that has been used. So can we go, uh, go next to the next slide? This is from the CGTN. Next slide, please. This Marita. one? Yeah. This yeah. is from the CGTN, which is showing you how sharply the poverty percentage has been falling and it is not in 2020, it has fallen to zero. It has fallen to zero twice before. You know, it has fallen to almost zero by 28 and again fallen to zero by 2010. But the government at that time did not publicize it the way it has publicized the most recent decline, probably because it thought there was something wrong and quite rightly with this because the ground reality showed that there was in, enormous uh, protest in rural areas, there was distress, there were actually very large numbers of people involved. So this was a spurious decline that you were getting because you're following a spurious method. I happened to be in um, Shanghai 18 months ago, a little more than 18, 20 months ago in October of 2019. At that time, the official poverty line was 8.8 .8 yuan per day. And 50% of it, if you assume, is to be spent on food and half on non-food. I asked my hosts who were economists, some of them were economists, others were not economists, I asked them, if half of 8.8 .8 yuan per day, which is the Chinese official poverty line, is spent on food, what can you buy for four yuan? And I could see myself, all you could buy for four yuan is one liter of bottled water. This is a bottle, one liter bottle orange juice to begin with, but just to show you the size. That is all you can buy from the official poverty line, devoted to food. And at that poverty line, there will be no survivors. So poverty estimation in India is wrong. Actual poverty is enormously high. Poverty estimation in China has been wrong. Actual poverty is very much lower than in India because as has been rightly pointed out by previous speakers, China has been much more sensitive than India to the question of poverty alleviation. And the government of China started to change course from about 2005, 6 when it saw 
that ground level poverty was rising and rural distress was rising, there were 60 to 70,000 cases of recorded rural protests alone by that time. It started to change course and tried very hard to reverse course, to reduce the level of investment in the economy and to increase the level of consumption. But once you let the tiger loose from the cage, it's very difficult to put it back. Once you start market-oriented growth, it's very difficult to get back to a people-oriented growth. But I'm very glad to hear that at least uh, the government claims that that is what it is doing now. It is up to the people themselves. And I explained to Radhika that I am not a partisan of any government, whether Indian or Chinese. I have always been and I'm a partisan of the welfare of the people. So it is up to people's organizations themselves to keep the government on track, to make sure that they fulfill their promises. And I would completely agree with what Roland Burr said earlier about basic human rights. It's very easy to provide food security, publicly funded affordable healthcare, utilities and education to everybody, provided you tax the rich, the class of rich that you have created through market-oriented policies, and you redistribute to the people who are poor, and this will not be helped by saying there are no poor. There are extremely poor. A colleague in China says that, to whom I talked uh, just a year and a half ago, said that the realistic poverty line in China for extreme poverty now is 10,000 yuan per year which is about two and a half times the official poverty line of 4,000 yuan for 2020. And roughly about a quarter of the population is below this. So that is where I end. I'm sorry if I put a spanner in the works, but as a Marxist, I feel that our commitment is to look critically at every claim and to be consistent partisans of people's welfare. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thanks so much, Utsa. I think the, you, you strike an important note there. Uh, let me now introduce our next speaker, uh, Mick Dunford. Michael Dunford is a visiting professor at the Institute of Geographical Sciences and Natural Resources Research at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's also Emeritus Professor at the School of Global Studies at the University of Sussex and Managing Editor of Area and Development Policy, which is a journal. Um, he graduated with a BSc in Geography and MSc in Quantitative Economics from the University of Bristol. His interests are in global development at multiple geographical scales and with special reference to different times to Europe and the Western world, China and Eurasia, drawing on materialist conceptions of history and geography and on theories of uneven and combined development, regulation and geopolitical economy. So Mick, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Thank you, Radhika. Um, I'd like to share my screen, if I may. Uh, yes, I'll make you co-host right away. There you are. Okay, you should be able to do that. Okay. Can you, can you see the screen? Yep, mm -hmm. you, may, you might want to make it full screen. Okay. Um, it's at the bottom right, yeah, there you go. It's okay. Um, mm, yes, that's, uh, it's still not full screen actually, you've chosen okay. the so it, two you, monitors. You, if you just go back to the one we had before and I'll tell you where the, the button is. If you go out of this mode. Ah, that's better, but why is it now showing strange? But it's only showing half the thing, half the slide, or three quarters of the slide. Maybe you want to reduce the, ah, no. Uh, actually, if you just go back to the non-full screen, I'll show you where to, oh, that's it. That's perfect. Okay. Just go. Yeah. Okay. Um. I shall probably read um, what I've written on the slides um, for the sake of time. Um, in 1949, China was virtually the poorest country in the world. And for 20 years, it was embargoed by the United States and by Western countries. 
In that period, the embargo applied to medicines, fertilizers, tractors, and so on. And yet, in 1949 to 1981, life expectancy increased from 35 to 68. The population virtually doubled from 554 million to 1,114 million. And in 1981, the World Bank published a report. According to that report, 1979 life expectancy in China of 64 was higher than the average of 51 for low income countries and 61 for middle income countries, although China was still a poor country, a very poor country. Adult literacy stood at 66% compared with 39% in low income countries and 72% in middle income countries. While net primary school enrollment at 93% was just short of that for industrialized countries at 94%. At that time, basically, Chinese people were poor. And I think if Utsa went back to some of the rural areas, if she visited them in 1983, she will see very, very significant increases in the absolute standards that prevail. But at that time, according to Chinese poverty line, 30.7% were under the poverty line. Socialist China, basically established new social relations of production because the view that was taken was that poverty was a consequence of capitalism. So in 1950, China adopted the agrarian reform law of the People's Republic of China. And by 1952, about 700 million moved land had been assigned to more than 300 farmers, 300 million farmers, 100 million farming households living in 4 million natural villages. Subsequently, China guaranteed work and the provisioning kind of food, health, and education. From 1956, it established a minimum life guarantee, the so-called new part. So in that period, China, although China was still a very poor country, made extraordinary progress, as other people have remarked, in addressing poverty. And indeed, you know, at that point in time, the World Bank took the view that there was no extreme poverty in China, although it was universally a poor country. In the 1970s, uh, the relationships with the United States improved and immediately, you know, under, under, uh, under Mao Zedong and under Zhou Enlai, China embarked on, in fact, opening up, acquiring capital goods from uh, Western countries. And then in 1979, China embarked on decentralization and market reform, leading, of course, to China's extraordinary economic growth. And that economic growth did make a contribution to poverty alleviation. Although the contribution to poverty alleviation was clearly less than it might have been had inequality not increased as much as it did. But in that period, there was an, an extraordinary transformation of the lives of hundreds of millions of people. And that, you know, I think that in a sense, oh, no, underplayed that, the significance of that transformation. China realized, however, that meeting the most fundamental needs of all human, being, all human beings, the right to life, which itself depends on access to food, shelter, and clothing, required more than economic growth, significantly more than economic growth. So in 1982, the State Council set up a leading group for agricultural development in the so-called Sansi, the Three Wests, in Lingxia. And what they started to put in place is what we call a, de a development-oriented poverty alleviation program. And it's a development-oriented program that's to a large extent shaped China's extraordinary success in, I would say, eliminating extreme poverty. At that time, most rural poverty was concentrated in 14, what the, one can call contiguous destitute areas. These areas were recognized officially in 2010, but it was known much earlier. Poverty was largely concentrated in these often mountainous, remote areas, very difficult environmental conditions, often large shares of minority peoples. From that point in time, successive plans were implemented and the poverty standard was adjusted, which explains you know, why one moved to near uh, elimination of poverty and then suddenly it jumps because the standard was raised. Successive plans were implemented. So from 1986 to 93, from 1994 to 2001, 
2087 program, which identified 592 poor counties. And then in uh, 2001 uh, to 10, target, target villages were identified and households that needed assistance were identified. And then from 2010 to 20, a new poverty alleviation program was put in place. And then Jinjun Fupin, the targeted poverty alleviation program was put in place in 2013. So it's important to recognize that in 1999, China adopted common prosperity as a key goal. And that adoption of that objective played a very significant role in transforming China in the new millennium. In 2002, it phased out agricultural taxes and fees. It introduced agroecological compensation schemes to which generated incomes for rural people whose lands were converted to forest and to other. Uh, natural habitats. In 2003, it introduced a new rural cooperative medical insurance scheme, which costs extremely little and which covers a huge share of the costs of any illness that anyone has. And it has something like 97% coverage of the population. In 2007, DBAL, minimum subsistence allowance, was introduced and steps were taken to implement the target of nine years of compulsory education with absolutely dramatic progress in the last uh, seven or eight years. At the same time, by 1999, China adopted Western development. After 2005, it adopted the new socialist countryside. These programs put infrastructure into the countryside, into every single administrative village, you know, water, electricity, gas, uh, internet access, and so on. Wider regional planning for destitute areas involved major infrastructure investments. So the figure is a map of the Wuling Mountain area, which is one, one of these one of these destitute areas. And you can see the major infrastructure plans basically connecting that area with the cities of Chongqing, with Guiyang, with Guizhou province, with the Changsha in Hunan, with uh, Wuhan in Hubei province. So, this infrastructure played a very fundamental role because it, in a sense, created the conditions in which one could promote a development-oriented poverty alleviation program. And then, as has been explained, alongside that, China established these uh, individual plans with individual households, essentially designed to monitor their situation in extraordinary detail, to monitor the way it evolved over the course of time, to develop strategies through which they individually could address their housing conditions, their employment, and their uh, livelihood circumstances. So, I mean, I would argue that this was uh, an extraordinarily successful program, which basically did achieve, you know, did remove, you know, the scourge of extreme poverty in China. And as Rubik actually explained at the beginning, it's a program that process that will continue. But why was it successful? I would Please say... Please be closer to the mic because... Okay. Yeah. So why was it successful? Well, for four, four major reasons. The first was sustained and determined political and financial commitment. In the last eight years, 1.6 trillion yuan. And that was not all that was spent because uh, there were significant social contributions as well. In a political and economic system whose central goal is shared prosperity, and in a society which is accepted that addressing poverty is the common responsibility of all and that poverty is not the fault of the poor. Second, a set of institutional mechanisms that integrate central design, central planning of a clear overall strategy, subnational responsibility and decentralized city, county, local, village implementation. Third, an extraordinary and sustained mobilization of human resources, which has already been mentioned. I mean, the chart just plots the numbers of village-based work teams that were in service in the last seven years, where these people worked with individual households and individual persons in order to find ways to transform their lives. And four specific socialist aspects of China's development model, including the role of public investment, an increased degree of decommodification of welfare services and a set of collective rural assets, and rural property rights that afford a degree of security, solidarity and opportunity. Thank you. 
That's great, Mick. Thanks very much. Uh, perfectly in time. Our next speaker is Tings Chak. Uh, Tings is a writer, artist, and activist born in Hong Kong and currently living in Shanghai. Her work has contributed to people's struggles in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. She leads the arts department and is a researcher at the Tricontinental, the, and the Institute for Social Research, and an editor of Dongsheng News. She's also a Globetrotter People Dis People's Dispatch Fellow. Uh, she is the principal author of the Tricontinental's upcoming study on China's poverty alleviation program. So Tings, please take it away. Thank you, everyone. It's an honor to be here. Thank you to the organizers, Friends of Socialist China and Geopolitical Economic uh, Research Group um, and the speakers on this webinar. Uh, it's an honor to join you from Shanghai um, to share one of the great stories of the century, really, a historic achievement for humanity. And just actually a few blocks away um, from the a site of the first Congress of the CPC that is celebrating its centenary in a few uh, days. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about what, uh, what sparked and what is contained in this study that uh, Rathaga um, mentioned that we've been doing at Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. Um, we were observing last year these two great victories, you know, combating COVID-19 and the end of extreme poverty at the same time that, you know, we're seeing huge reverses globally uh, in poverty last year. And, and for us, it was uh, kind of um, a very interesting thing to look into. Um, how, how is this a continuation or a manifestation of the socialist mission and organization of Chinese society today? And clearly a story that hasn't been told enough, um, nearly silenced in Western media. And so, um, I'm going to share some of those points and stories. We're going to publish this um, study in the 23rd of July, which is actually the historical date of the first Congress. There's a quick anecdote is that apparently Mao Zedong had forgotten the actual date when he was asked of the foundation meeting. And he said it was summer in Shanghai it was quite hot, let's say July 1st. So we'll be publishing on the official date. And this publication goes into five key parts, looking at the historical context. Um, looking at the evolution of population theory and practice, uh, and specifically, of course, the targeted poverty alleviation phase, and specific case studies and challenges on, um, and, and the horizons uh, to look forward to. And we had a chance to interview some uh, leading Chinese and international um, experts in this area, uh, as well as make field, field visits to Guizhou, which is a province um, where the last nine counties were lifted out of poverty. So we got to speak with peasants, uh, party cadre, business owners, workers, youth, women, and elders who were directly impacted by the campaign, um, who not only were lifted, but lifted themselves out of poverty. And I'll share a couple of those stories today. Um, so in fact, this, this um, this is going to be part of a series that we're publishing on, on socialist construction, because one of the key understandings we had, and it was confirmed as we were doing this research, is that China's eradication of extreme poverty is a fundamental step in this ongoing process of socialist construction. So looking into the history a little bit, I mean, we hear the numbers, 800 or 850 million people exited poverty since the reform opening of period. But we don't see this as apart from, but actually a part of the China's multi-generational fight since the founding of the CPC, uh, PRC and CPC. Um, and the successes of the last four decades were you know, built on the backs of the huge agrarian, industrial and social advances that we've heard a lot about already from our, our speakers uh, during the Mao period. So this is a continuation in that uh, socialist process. And, and when we look at the uh, Xi Jinping period when he assumed presidency in 2013, um, the question of how to uplift the last hundred million, the most difficult pockets of poverty emerged and cliff communities like Li Jingjing's talked about, uh, you know, where, where people take half a day to descend the mountain to buy a pack of salt or to go to school. How do you reach that? So, you know, we have the, the slogan, the one income, two assurances of food and clothing, the three guarantees of housing, education, and basic health care. But beyond a measure of an income and beyond the slogan, um, China actually approached this in a multidimensional way using the language of Nobel laureate Amartya Sen. And it was not a cash transfer program, not a NGO led project like we see a lot of places in the West or other parts of the global South. Um, and the targeted phase really meant that you had to look at know where the pe poor people are, 
who, who they are first, where they are, and how they can exit poverty. And so what did this take? It took a mass mobilization of broad sectors of society, millions of people um, in uh, state-owned enterprises, private enterprises, uh, government departments, civil society, and even the military involved you know, uh, in this process. It's impossible to uplift 1.4 billion people out of extreme poverty, you know, to eradicate that in a society that large um, without mass mobilization of society. But of course, that being led under the leadership of the party. And, and the party also assessed for itself, you know, in order to be able to take this on, it needs to also strengthen its, its basis, strengthen its relationship, especially in the countryside. Um, you know, uh, we, we heard about the size of the, the organization, over 92 million members. If the CPC was actually uh, a country, it would be the 16th most populous nation in the world. It's a huge organization, but it also needed to strengthen its ties to the grassroots. Um, so we got to follow actually some of the party cadre in their daily work, um, including one person named Liu Yuan Shui, who is 47 to 70 year old, um, 47 year old um, government official who was one of the 3 million people cadre that were sent to live and work in the countryside. And so uh, he was sent to this village called Danyang in Guizhou. And it was a place where it was, uh, the party made a self-evaluation that it was, um, had a weak organization needed to be strengthened. So he was sent there to help build um, more the over 250,000 teams um, that accompanied the process in every um, village to ensure that every village had one team and every household was assigned one cadre. And Mr. Liu was one of them spend two to three years at a time, difficult conditions. Um, we've even heard many sacrifice their lives. And so we went to see some of their visits, you know, the home visits. His cell phone is off all the time, all the time. We chat messages. It, it doesn't look like the grand work of lifting people out of poverty. It looked like the very daily details of, you know, someone calls him and says, Mr. Zhang says, oh, my door lock stopped working today. Can you help me come fix it? Or someone's son, refused to go to school. So can you come over to help counsel? Um, or how to get um, a villager a job, you know, these kinds of daily life details. But in short, it's a way of, you know, meeting the concrete needs of the people. Uh, and that's the way you can build trust and confidence in, in the party and the organization. But of course, you know, sometimes there's this flattening view that poverty alleviation was a singular mandate coming from above, you know, coming from the skies or something. But it's actually something highly highly decentralized and highly diverse. You get to the ground, it's not just the word of people like Mr. Liu, but the community and the poor people themselves. There's these uh, kind of meetings called democratic appraisal meetings where uh, the villagers actually are really? there to assess and evaluate um, their own, um, um, whether, uh, whether they should be listed as poverty, poverty stricken, should be, um, have they emerged? Have they fallen back? That's a kind of grassroots democracy in practice that is really impressive to see. And we had some moments to, to talk about that. And I'll just share with, yeah, I got you. Thank you, thank you. So just to kind of share one more quick story about, um, you know, I think as Marxists, we understand that the subjective transformation accompanies the process of the material transformation. And for many people, uh, the process of emerging from being poor, from going from the countryside to the city it's quite impressive. So we met one woman named He Ying, who was a peasant woman who relocated to the city named Tongren. And it, her family was actually initially not very excited about this idea. They didn't know what was happening. But she herself, when she was asked why she decided to relocate, she says, I've been a, I've been a, a migrant worker in another province where um, I get to see my family once a year. Uh, for her, it was an opportunity to actually reunite the family for the first time where multi-generations can live together. And in the process of lifting herself out of poverty, she actually became a party leader and now is the, the head of the local party branch and the chairman of the Women's Federation. And she shared many interesting experiences, you know, about how to address this question of, oh, well, people don't want to move. When we look at people who are in their 60s, 70s, who have never left the countryside, they've never seen a zebra crossing. They have never seen an elevator. The process of this transformation is actually having people like um, He Ying, organizing what they call six firsts, um, where they basically walk with elders across the street to ride an elevator, to go shopping for the first time. And, 
And so this is just to say the complicated, you know, and the diverse uh, diversity behind the process of poverty alleviation is, is many. And, and today I've only been able to share a little, little preview of what um, uh, we have in the study. So I encourage you all that on the 23rd, on the centenary, the actual centenary, to check out the publication. It'll be on the tricontinental.org. And also for anyone who's interested in more news analysis coming from China, from the perspective of China, because there's a big wall of, of a media silence, let's say, um, also can have a look at Dongsheng News. That's a, organized by a collective of researchers. So with that, um, thank you all. And, and, uh, and yes, and it's great to be part of this event. Thanks very much, Tings. And please do share the link to where they'll find the thing. And also I, I've heard lots of requests for slides. Uh, and I think it's best if you write, I, I'll share with us slides if anybody wants. Mick's happy to share his if you write him an email. And he's put his email address in the chat. So please look at it. Okay, let's go to our next speaker. It is Ovigwe uh, Egwegu. Uh, Ovigwe is a columnist for the China Africa Project based in Nigeria. He specializes in geopolitics, in particular reference to Africa in the changing global order. His work includes policy relevant research, consulting, and providing expertise on regional trends, risks, and scenarios. So Ovigwe, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation and thanks to everyone here. I've really learned a lot, which is quite interesting given there are so many. Um, Owigwe, your video is not on. Yeah, sorry, my network is really bad. I don't know if it would work, but I've been going off and on since. So I'd better we'll have just the audio, but let me try okay. if, if it As you work. wish. All right. we, we can try and if it doesn't work, you can turn it off. Yeah, is it is it working now? Can you see? Good. All right, so uh, my, my uh, talk or my presentation basically will just center around more of a lessons learned uh, in terms of looking at China's uh, rise because we've heard so much from within, but how is it perceived from, from outside, particularly for us here in Africa who have been struggling with the question of development and poverty alleviation for decades. So uh, looking at it from outside as an, as an African or as a Nigerian and African looking at China, there are, there are very clear lessons you know, that we can learn. One of them is the importance of political institutions. And when it, co when it comes to development, that, that it cannot be emphasized enough that if you, if you lack, you know, a state and state with, with strong and accountable political institutions, you would not be able to achieve the kind of success or even come close to what, uh, what, what China has been able to achieve over the, you know, the last, you know, uh, 100 years or since 1949 to be more precise. Now, uh, with the, the Chinese party state is a product of a people's re revolution and that not, not only gives it legitimacy to govern, you know, uh, the People's Republic of China, but also comes to an enormous responsibility to be accountable uh, to, to the people. So it is not, surpri it's not surprising that it is centenary of, this, of the Chinese, uh, uh, the Communist Party of China that they have chosen, you know, the, uh, poverty alleviation as the, the, the achievement that they are most proud of. It, that, it is only it's only a socialist or a Marxist country, you know, that will do that because there are so many other achievements that they can they could actually use as the one, you know, one that they are most proud of. And then secondly, uh, the, the, the role of the state is something that is also very, very instructive because you would see with, with the Chinese model, the state is not a spectator or I say laser first state you know, that we here in Africa have been, we've been beating down our necks or our heads rather with all of these uh, you know, uh, Western institutions, the IMF, World Bank, always uh, asking for a small state, a small state and opening up the, the economy that would definitely lead to prosperity. It hasn't worked. And it's not it's currently you know, not working. And further down this talk, I'm going to, to touch on that a little bit more. So that's you know, that system where you have a, a state leading, not, not uh, leading the the, the, the very very important. And then for, for for very specific reason, you would find with China that the, there's more emphasis on account on a substan substantial accountability as opposed to procedural accountability. What I mean by that is when a state is judged or the, what the, the, the 
importance of the state or sorry, the, the, the citizenry looks at the state or the sorry, the, the state looks at its functionality or its ability to provide basic needs, you know, and prosperity to the people as more important than you know uh merely holding you know elections. This 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 seems like you know an ideological standpoint, but it comes with very practical and very pragmatic uh, benefits when the political institutions prioritize, you know, substance over 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 procedures, and also you also find that with the with the, with the importance of rule of law and also the independence of the states to be, to be able to govern their affairs and direct how development is, is going, you know, to go. One one very short example would be many of the during the course of China's development, you will find that they a lot of experimentation. I can almost guarantee that China would not have been able to put out, you know, experiment and try some of those, uh, those uh, uh, po uh, policies. For instance, this you know, real relocation of people, if it's if it's a development part is being charted by the World Bank, because we hear things like, you know, what about people's rights to their land and, and things like that. But for us in Africa, we always ask the question: what, what about people's right to eat? You know, to live in a decent home and and in a decent environment with clean water, you know, food and all of that. that, that that's also very important. But like, like I said, all of those, those processes that we've seen China, some of the process rather that we've seen China enact or policies rather would not have been possible, you know, if they, there was no political institutions were not independent of foreign, you know, uh, influence over the course of the last uh, 40 years or even going back 100 years. Now another uh, another aspect of this look of uh, looking at China would be the importance of soft and hard infrastructure. You know, earlier on, earlier on uh, uh, in this talk, we had very important you know statistics comparing what was achieved, what was, for instance, uh, in 1949 when Mao took over, or have life expectancy was about you know 35 years. You know, literacy rate was 15%. Immunization rate was actually zero. This I actually found when I was preparing for this. And then by 76, when when Mao, when Mao died, you know, average life expectancy was was you know was near, was about an immunization rate was 100%. You know, oftentimes you always hear in, uh, the talk that it was under Deng that you know China was able able to develop like as if nothing what didn't happen or all that happened before Deng Xiaoping was disaster or leftist, one left field leftist policy, you know, over another. But the way I always like to you know, think of it is China crawled other under Mao so it could run under Deng and fly, you know, under uh, uh, President Xi. And really, literally, China is flying today. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's even in, uh, as a feeling of this world, given the, the Chinese space station. But more, more seriously, when I, what I mean by flying here, I'm talking about Trans, transferring growth or transforming growth into real development and not just GDP growth, but actual you know, life chances and, and quality of life. And it is something that is missing from the policy discourse, you know, even here in Nigeria. Let me give an example. Nigeria, Nigeria is, you know, it's ranked 27th in the world in terms of GDP with uh, or GDP 448 billion. Meanwhile, Denmark, for instance, you know, comes in at uh, 48, you know, with a GDP around 300 and, uh, 350 billion. But I can, you don't need to look at any other inf information to know that, we, uh, so you, don't, you, need to, you need to look at the other statistics in the country, like Human Development Index, you know, mortality rate, infant morbidity, you know, uh, enrollment rates and all, and, and, you know, uh, other measures of uh, uh, living standards to know that China and Nigeria and Denmark is world apart. So that's why it is also important if, you look, if, you, if we see what China is doing today, the emphasis on high quality development, high quality development. This is language that is being reinforced over and over again on how they can transform speed or sorry, less emphasis on speed and transform this humongous, you know, and really uh, admirable develop, uh, economic growth into real practical you know, development that would capture way more than just, you know, the GDP. So, but essentially, uh, lastly, I, a bit of more uh, comparison, 
we we'll always find here in Africa, when we're looking at China and looking at all of these are uh, these major countries that have been able to pull pull, you know, a, impressive growth and development in development. You know, we we'll always we're always in this uh, dilemma where if you want to look towards the West, you, the emphasis is on governance and institutions and democracy and in and you know, physical uh, you know uh, physical transparency and all of that. And then if we're looking towards uh, China, we're, we're seeing more about having independent political institutions and rule of infrastructure, which is very, you know, which is uh, very, very in, in important. So what here, it's good to look at very clear examples and why infrastructure is proven to, it, it, it's proven to be very, very important in, in a country development, not just with, not just with, uh, for China. For example, you know, you would, uh, based on allegations of lack of trans, uh, lack of uh, uh, accountability and transparency and environmental considerations, the World Bank actually stopped a 500 and 500 million dollar, uh, dollar loan to Ethiopia that was trying to generate electricity, you know, to power a development growth, you know, uh, and and for for the Gibe Three Dam and also did the same thing when we were trying to secure financing for the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, which the country continues to argue is crucial for its own you know, develop, development and en energy needs. But, so that, that pushed Ethiopia to actually get this money from within. So in Ethiopia, every civil servant has to forfeit right? one month of- You are yeah, nearly out of time. One month of their salaries to finance these dams. So what I'm trying to say here is there's a good, the, the, it is good and to see what China has been able to do with its own model of development that prioritizes soft infrastructure, you know, quality of life and hard infrastructure. And that is also something that, you know, uh, the world has a lot to learn from, particularly us, you know, here, you know, in Africa. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here to share, you know, uh, my perspective on China's development and also looking at it from the, pers the perspective of an, if a Nigerian and African, you know, uh, contributing to this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ovigwe. We are, our next speaker is Camilla Escalante. Camilla is a journalist normally based in Bolivia, although I think at the moment she's in El Salvador. She reports on social movements, socialism, and the fight against imperialism and related struggles from Latin America. So Camilla, please go ahead. Uh, I think you're still muted, Camilla. You're correct. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Like you said, I am normally based in Bolivia and Bolivia has had a number of very important uh, cooperative, mutually uh, beneficial uh, relationships and projects with um, with with China dating back to the uh, presidency of Evo Morales. When Evo Morales um, and the movement towards socialism took power in 2006, Evo said that he faced a colonial state and a country which was completely submerged in extreme poverty. Um, and the remnants of that is are obviously still visible today. Um, Evo told CGTN in 2018 in an interview, he said, I trust China very much. We're strategic allies, though Bolivia is small and China is so large. China has always accompanied us um, in many of our aspirations in the social, cultural, political, and economic spheres. This is why we have unique trust in the People's Republic of China. He said that during his visit, he uh, was uh, to China, he was discussing investment and in credit and signing agreements um, in the order to export coffee, quinoa, soybeans, meat, and other organic and healthy food products. Um, and he said that, you know, this goes hand in hand with the country's struggle to eradicate extreme poverty um, and their aims to, to work towards equality. Um, in partnership with China, only after Evo Morales came to power in 20, 2006, uh, China began an important player with investments in lithium, uh, a very important part of the 
Bolivian economy is uh, Bolivia's uni lithium reserves, but also with roads and a state sugar company and other uh, major, uh, other important sectors and projects where we live in the Tropico of Cochabamba. It's a large, vast rural area. We're about five hours away from the nearest city. And there right now currently is a, a China, Bolivia, infrastructural highway building project. And it is absolutely massive. Um, this will take our travel time from five hours, reducing it to two hours. Um, and I don't know how it would be possible to build such a road in such a small amount of time uh, without that assistance of China. And something that we hope to be able to report on the ground um, on those developments as that highway is constructed. Evo also works with China to build a satellite called the Tupac Katari satellite, um, which is named after an indigenous leader uh, in Bolivia who fought the Spanish empire. And without that expertise to be able to launch a rocket into space to have a satellite up there, we wouldn't have had uh, the connection to internet and phone signal in all corners of the country that Bolivia has now. And of course, China has also provided bil uh, billion dollar loans to Bolivia. Now, under the current president, Luis Arce, um, he has retaken the path after the restoration of democracy following the uh, 2019 year long coup. Now, Bolivia is retaking the path of industri industrialization, um, industrializing Bolivia's natural resources, upon which all of these great important poverty alleviation works were built. Um, this is, of course, key because Bolivia's economic model since the movement towards socialism took national power since the popular sectors, uh, the working class took power when Evo Morales came, has been uh, to uh, nationalize resources, take control of natural resources, industrialize them um, and uh, and profit from them in order to reinvest in social programs. And this has reached every corner um, of the, of, uh, you know, the fruits of that have reached every corner um, through the redistributive policies of, of the socialist government. Arce himself was a member of a Marxist group before coming to Evo's government. And he's remarked on the similarities between China and Bolivia and that Mao, like Evo, came from a rural area um, and the revolution came from the countryside to the city. Um, another country that I report a lot on um, is Venezuela, and China has been key in defying the U.S. illegal sanctions, which are unilateral coercive sanctions by the United States, which are aimed at suffocating and killing the Venezuelan people. Um, so China has um, had the role of, uh, you know, buying oil and providing the country with vital resources to fight the pandemic. Um, you know, since the since COVID-19 arrived here and or arrived in South America. And just the very act of continuing to trade with Venezuela has been an invaluable contribution to poverty alleviation because it's because of the death and starvation sanctions imposed by Washington that the popular sectors, uh, the poor people in Venezuela are suffering so much under the blockade. And of course, the same goes for Cuba under the decades long uh, U.S. blockade on Cuba, which was struck down by overwhelming majority in the United Nations um, in a vote on the same uh, resolution in which, of course, China pronounced itself, its ambassador in the U.N. pronounced itself um, in support of the lifting of that blockade on, on uh, Cuba. Um, Let's see. So, you know, China continues to cooperate with Venezuela um, against the illegality of these uh, U.S. unilateral coercive measures. Um, and that's, this is despite the fact that it's so difficult to engage in a country like Venezuela with all of the complications um, involved. And Venezuela is a country which has historically relied on its oil revenue and had not, according to uh, Nicolas Maduro, President Nicolas Maduro had not exported a single um, barrel of oil for 14 months um, because of the sanctions. But despite that, China has continued to seek ways to resume purchase and shipments of crude oil and fuel, which contributes to the Bolivarian nation's 
aims to restore this vital source of income from the state. And it's notable and important that uh, both the countries that are aligned with Venezuela and those who have those which have surrendered their sovereignty to the United States are both able to trade and cooperate and build and participate in investment projects and benefit from Chinese expertise and more without discrimination. China has in no way said that, you know, these are a political uh, or geopolitically strategic allies or any such thing like that, they have been seen present throughout the continent. Colombia and Brazil are two of the most important US allies in South America, but a Chinese uh, company closed a construction uh, deal to build a subway in Bogota, Colombia in 2019. And China is Brazil's largest uh, trade partner and has major investments in Peru, Brazil, and Ecuador, all of which have been under regimes that are, of course, um, allied with the United States very closely. I'm currently in El Salvador, where the former leftist president, Salvador Sanchez Seren of the FMLN, um, in 2018 announced that they would break ties with Taiwan and that they would recognize China and that they would be um, uh, looking for new ways to cooperate with China. A year later, uh, the neoliberal who took power, which is the current president, Naib Bukele, came into office and he reaffirmed the country's uh, uh, stance to to take up different projects with China as well. So in the case of El Salvador, like I said, where I am now, it hasn't mattered uh, whether the government were leftist or rightist, but both have recognized the importance of China's role in uh, supporting development projects. And of course, COVID, uh, you know, in the area of COVID, we can't uh, say enough about the extent to which China has been active here, like I said, in Venezuela, of course, in uh, Bolivia has been very important. Uh, China donated more than $34 million worth of health materials and explain and, uh, and, and equipment. And it has supplied vaccines to most Latin American countries and has also had uh, it's scientists, Chinese scientists, share their experiences, medical professionals share their experiences with Latin American governments and health teams here. Um, the biggest recipient of Chinese shots um, have been, or have or will be China and Brazil. And we at Kasashuan News, um, myself and Radio Kasashuan Coca, all of us in Bolivia were vaccinated with the Sinopharm, including myself, um, when they extended vaccination to journalists. So that was a very important thing that was able to happen only because of Bolivia's cooperation with China. If I was in the US and Canada, I might not have been vac vaccinated yet. Um, and so I'm just gonna list, wrap up by listing some key areas of cooperation. Um, China and Cuba are working together for the expansion of, and strengthening of internet in Cuba and cybersecurity. This is crucial. Obviously, the United States uses the lack of um, internet infrastructure uh, to attack Cuba and to say it's backwards and behind. Um, there are, you know, very many complicated reasons why Cuba has taken this long to get where it is technologically in the area of internet, but it has come very far and it's coming far with the help of China. China offered um, its assistance to Venezuela and, of course, President Maduro and the government uh, solicited that assistance in 2018 during the Apagones, these massive, um, historically um, large blackouts, large-scale blackouts across the country, which were the re result of terrorist attacks by a sector of the opposition. China lent its um, expertise during that period. And um, a, new, a newly opened energy park in uh, Argentina's Jujuy province is now the largest in Latin America, other energy project, wind plants in Cuba, Colombia, Chile. Um, obviously, several Latin American countries are now able to export food to China. And of course, very importantly, rather than ex, uh, you know exporting military bases and hostile patrolling of the Pacific and Atlantic waters, China is building infrastructure and contributing to the, the betterment of you know the situation of citizens of Latin America through cooperation without coercive conditions through partnerships and, you know, with a policy of non-intervention and through sharing its expertise and technology. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.
Um, that's wonderful. Thank you, Camilla. Um, very energetic and uh, informative. Our next speaker is John Ross. John is Senior Fellow at the Chongyang Institute for Financial Studies at the Renmin University in China. Since 1992 uh, and the publication in Russia of his Why Economic Reform Succeeded in, Chi uh, in, in China and Will Fail in Russia and Eastern Europe, he has been the author of over 500 published articles on China's economy and geopolitical relations. He has more than a million followers on Weibo, the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. Um, his articles on China's economy have won several prizes. Uh, his uh, re two recent best-selling books in Chinese are The Great Chess Game and Don't Misunderstand China's Economy. And his new book in English is China's Great Road, which is published this month by International Publishers and 1804 Books. Um, yeah, so John, please go ahead. The floor is yours. Could I share the screen, please? Uh, yes, John. Uh, there you go. There. Okay. Right. Now, just before I start on the, what I was going to say, I just want to stress something very much with followed on from what Camilla said, because... Uh, I, although this, my main specialist is the Chinese economy, I follow Latin American economy as close as I can. And I always point out that the economic policy in Latin America, which is closest to China, is Bolivia's, both from the point of economic, uh, the state, the role of the state, the very high levels of investment. And it was not simply the case, therefore, that Evo Morales started in the countryside and went to the cities, although that was something in common with Mao Zedong. It was also that the economic policies in Latin America are most like those of China. I would love at some point to go into discussion. I can't do it today, but I just wanted to emphasize it very much. Uh, John, um, I think your video is off. Sorry? Your video is perhaps off. The video is... Oh, sorry. There, that's better. Right, okay, fine. Sorry, that's my fault. I apologize about that. Right, okay. Anyway, but you could hear what I said. OK, what, what I want to do here is really to point out that there are three phases of China's poverty allevi alleviation, each of which has got different methods. And it's important to understand all of them. As um, what's happened here? Why is this not going down? All right. Yeah. OK. As Radhika mentioned, um, my, this, I'm going to give you a summary, which is just in my book. Uh, the reason that there's two covers there is because there's a, a, a US edition uh, and a European edition. So therefore, I very much would encourage people to get that, of course, because this is only a very short summary of what's in that. that. OK, I'm going to use a consistent international um, definition of world poverty, which is the World Bank current one, which is $1.90 a day expenditure measured in what are technically known as purchasing power parities. I won't bother take the time to explain what that means, but it means it's a consistent international standard. Okay. The first thing that we first phase is what happened in China between 1949 and 1978. And this is the biggest social miracle in the whole of human history. And I say they, those are not exaggerated words, they're very carefully chosen words. You can make the best comparison between China with China and another country by looking at India because they achieved their modern economic ex political forms essentially at the same time, 1947 and 1949. And I want to look therefore at the first, the state of the social miracle is the incredible increases in life expectancy in China, shown in this red line. And look incidentally when this occurred during the 1960s, for example, and this immediately crushes all this talk that the Mao period was a great disaster, et cetera, et cetera. On the contrary, China saw the fastest increase in life expectancy in a major country in the whole of human history during the period of Mao Zedong. Uh, life expectancy increased on the best estimates by 31 years. That is by more than one year for every year that Mao was in power. And if you want to know why Mao Zedong is held in such esteem in China, it's for two reasons. Fundamentally, because he established the national independence of the country after a century in which China was simply trampled on by foreign countries. And secondly, if someone leads you to live 31 years longer than you expected, 
at the beginning, you tend to feel really well rather disposed towards them. And that explains the things and all these attempts, therefore, to portray um, Mao as some sort of horrible uh, maniac, great dictator, carry no weight, whatever in China, because people understand the reality in China of what it, Mao Zedong meant for that country. Okay. However, while there were spectacular social achievements, it should be said that economic growth in China during this period was not extremely high. Uh, the world per capita GDP growth from 1950 to 1978 was 2.7%. And China's per capita GDP growth was 2.8%, basically the same. The great social achievements of China were therefore due to the concentration on the correct things, that is on primary education, on primary health. Again, we could make a comparison to India, where the resources went into the universities, where they went into the top of the health system. This didn't deliver the type of improvements for the people that were delivered in China. So these were great social achievements, but it wasn't actually very rapid economic growth. What happened after 1978 with the introduction of the socialist market economy? I will, again, I don't have time to describe it, it's due with my book, but it's an, an economic system in line with Marx and has proved itself the most successful in the history of the world. From 1978 to 2020, China's annual GDP growth was 9.2%. This has no precedent in any major country in the whole of human history. And it was, of course, this econ gigantic economic growth that created the basis for the mass poverty reduction. People have pointed to specific programs and so on, which were very necessary, but without this enormous economic growth, this poverty reduction would not have been possible. Okay. Again, I just want to show the differences here. I've shown you the change, the I've taken a 10-year moving average just to get involved, get rid of the fluctuations. You can see the growth rate of China in the pro pre-1978 period. And then the much, much faster growth rate of China after 1978. So there was a quantum leap in China's level of economic growth with the introduction of the socialist market economy in 1978. What did this do for poverty reduction? Again, I've taken the World Bank standard. This is the reduction of poverty from its maximum. I've taken not from a single year because some countries had their maximum poverty later. India, for example, had ma maximum poverty after 1978. This shows you what is the cheap of China. By World Bank standards, 853 million people lifted out of poverty compared to India, which has an approximately equal population of 166 million. Now, you may say, of course, while the comparison to China and India is reasonable, the other countries are much smaller than China. So you wouldn't, it's not a big surprise, therefore, you might think it's not a big surprise that China had a much bigger poverty reduction. So I've therefore taken three areas of the world which do have approximately the same uh, population. The population of India is very slightly smaller than China's, but about only 100 million. The population of sub saharan the population of the whole of Africa is 1.4 billion, about the same as China, and sub-Saharan Africa accounts for the great bulk, great bulk of that. So you can see in sub-Saharan Africa, unfortunately, there has been no reduction in the number of people living in poverty, very unfortunately. In India, there has been some, which also shows it's socialism that reduces poverty, not capitalism. This is particularly important to deal with the farcical claims uh, that the reason that China's reduced poverty is because the introduction of capitalism. Well, in that case, if you thought that China had produced, uh, introduced uh, capitalism, in that case, there's a slightly puzzling question. Why didn't the poverty reduction take place in capitalist countries instead of socialist ones? I could go into many, many more arguments why China is a socialist country, but it's very weird. I'm oh, sorry, there's a little thing's fallen off of the one of the, the blue, but you can see what it is. If you take the world poverty reduction, 75% of the world poverty reduction took place in China. 
3% of world poverty reduction took place in socialist countries in Indochina, incidentally, where what is basically China's economic model was carried out. Uh, Laos and Cambodia also, and Vietnam have fantastic records in poverty reduction. China's is the biggest, but because by, by far it's the biggest country. So therefore, all developing capitalist countries, which have a much, much larger population than China, produce 22% of world's reduction in poverty, and China produced 75%. And if you take socialist countries together, it produced 78%. If you want a simple illustration of the fact that it's socialism that reduces poverty and not capitalism, I think you can find that in that chart. Then finally, as is correct, as Fructings has uh, emphasized, nevertheless, uh, after this gigantic economic growth, which was necessary to lift this eight more, you know, more than 800 million people out of poverty. Nevertheless, there were areas of the country which simply the huge economic growth could not get rid of the poverty. This, in some cases, was due to infrastructure problems, uh, geography problems, uh, historical problems, etc. And that had to be dealt with by targeted poverty reduction programs. And this is the great thing. They do, it wasn't, this is what's being done now. It wasn't left to so-called, uh, you know, just economic growth. Very specific and precise methods were taken. Uh, building infrastructure, uh, putting in the economy, and many of the things which Ting's uh, referred to. So finally, therefore, so as not to abuse the time, um, what I want to say, therefore, is we should really see China's poverty reduction as occurring in three great historical periods. The first is the Mao period, which is a, a, a social miracle, which has to be defended against all attacks on Mao. But it was not characterized by extremely rapid economic growth. And in very serious matters, you have to say what is the truth. Uh, some people want to extol the planned economy, etc. In China, I'm afraid the facts do not sustain that. Right. The uh, second period, which is the one which is the removal of hundreds of millions of people of poverty, was basically produced by the socialist market economy and the economic growth that was shown there. And then the third phase is the um, targeted program. So that this why we're tempted to give here is a view of the economic background to what were the poverty reduction programs in China. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks very much, John. Um, and we are going to our penultimate speaker, who is Senator Mushahid Hussein. Uh, Senator Hussein is the founding chairman of the Pakistan China Institute, a think tank, which is the premier Pakistani NGO platform uh, promoting people-to-people -people ties with China. He's also the chairman of uh, Pakistan Senate's Defense Committee. He was awarded the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence Award by Xi Jinping in April 2015 for his contributions to Pakistan-China relations. Which I had first went to China in 1917 as a young teenager, and then he headed the Pakistan-China Youth Friendship Association. Since then, he's made almost 100 visits to China, visiting different places, interacting with the Chinese political leadership and intelligentsia. During his studies in the United States for, for a master's in international relations, he focused on Chinese foreign policy and Chinese history. So Senator Hussein, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Radhika. Greetings from uh, Pakistan. And it's been a pleasure listening to such uh, scholarly informed presentations based on empirical analysis of China's remarkable success story. Uh, in my brief remarks, uh, and it's a pleasure to be in this platform of the Friends of Socialist China, and I wish you good luck for the future. In my brief remarks, I'd like to focus on our own experience as a Pakistani and Pakistan-China relations and how it has been important because when I first went to China, uh, it was in 1970, as, I, as she mentioned, and it was a flight from uh, 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 Pakistan to China on a PIA plane. Uh, there were some travelers from some Latin American and other Asian countries. And it was a voyage of discovery for me for a 17-year-old who was visiting as president of the Pakistan-China Youth Friendship Association. And uh, I remember that when we boarded the Chinese flight, airlines flight from uh, Shanghai to Beijing, the flight, there was no, of course, uh, 
uh, actually a flight attendant, which was more dressed like a red guard, the lady said, we begin our flight with a quotation from Chairman Mao. And I still remember the quotation, be resolute, fear no sacrifice, and surmount every difficulty to win victory. And we, when we landed in Beijing, it was amazing to see a country with huge boulevards. We were staying in uh, uh, Peking, uh, Beijing Ho Peking Hotel, now it's called Beijing Hotel. And uh, uh, there were empty boulevards, a lot of cyclists. But there was this spirit, the resilience of the Chinese people, you could feel that. And I was uh, lucky to see some, it was a period of the cultural revolution. Uh, players like the white-haired girl, the red detachment of women. And we met Chen Poda. He was the head of the cultural revolution group of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. So China was in a bit of a turbulence th those days because uh, uh, the cultural revolution was at, at its peak. But what Im impressed me was that there was a certain element. Poverty was there, but the pride was also there. Pride that Chinese were finally the masters of their own destiny. And now then I understood the meaning of the word when Chairman Mao announced on 1st of October 1949 that the Chinese people have stood up. So those after the century of humiliation. And since that period, I went again in different periods. I remember the period of Deng Xiaoping when there was a big banner in um, the Shanghai airport saying, getting rich is glorious. So there was a transformation when China was opening up. I think the roots of China's uh, successful eradication of uh, poverty, extreme poverty, lies in the Chinese revolution itself. And I think the period from when after the long march, when the Communist Party leadership and the People's Liberation Army, they built their base in Yunnan. And I was reading this book by John S. Service, which is a remarkable book, because it is based on a first-hand account of what was going on in Yunnan uh, by John S. Service. Uh, this American diplomat who was later hounded out of the State Department by the McCarthyites. And he talks of, he gives a very good profile. And I think the two elements that stand out is the clarity of policy of the Communist Party, while they are not in power yet, and the quality of leadership. And he does a profile of um, Chairman Mao, Zhou Enlai, Marshal Chu De, and all the other uh, marshals who were there, uh, Chen Yi, Ho Long, and others. So it's, it's an amazing element that in Yunnan, they had built up a successful mini socialist China. There was a university of resistance, which had about 10,000 graduates. They had a women's university. They had the largest arts academy in China. They had a pharma factory. They had a publishing house. So it was already uh, the makings of a new China were already in place in Yunnan from that base, from that period, from the long march till about 45 or so when the war resumed against Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, I would say the three elements have been very, very important uh, in this uh, campaign. Uh, eradication of poverty was the first priority. Then the emancipation of women. That was a very crucial element for China, which a lot of other Asian countries even today have not been able to do. Because that when Chairman Mao said the women hold half the sky, he really meant it because he took them out of the shackles of uh, male chauvinism, of uh, a patriotic society, of being sheltered in their houses, foot binding and so forth, and then unleash their energies. And of course, uh, the energies were unleashed in also negative directions when the, by Madame Chiangqing. But otherwise, the Chinese women, I think without uh, their role as members of the workforce, this kind of transformation would not have been possible. The other important element, which I think was very important also, was a peaceful foreign policy. Unlike other countries which were progressing, which were rising, China has not had any imperial ambitions. China is the only country which has risen, which has developed without invading, without conquering any territory. And I think that is a very key element in their uh, success story. I remember a conversation uh, which was reported uh, three years ago between uh, President Trump and President Carter. And uh, this was, I think, about uh, uh, in 2018 or 19. And Car uh, Trump tells Carter and his president that, look here, the Chinese are getting ahead of us. Uh, and uh, 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 how do we respond to China? And China will soon be a major power. And Carter says, it's very simple. Uh, I normalized relations with China in 1979. 
for the last 40 years, China has been at peace with itself, while we have been at war throughout this period. That is the crucial difference. I think the focus on development. And I remember uh, one hour long conversation when I first met uh, uh, Xi Jinping, he was vice president. And this was in 2010 or 11. And it was in the Great Hall of the People. And when we talked about issues, I found him a leader with a difference. He was not relying on any notes or any advice from his uh, uh, aides. He was clear. He gave a clear vision of China from 2010 till 2050 for the next 40 years. And the focus was inward development and good neighborly relations. And Pakistan has been very fortunate that we as a neighbor of China have been uh, benefiting from this strategic partnership that we have developed with China for the last 50 or 60 years. And uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, is the flagship. And China has invested heavily in that, and it has benefited Pakistan. For a time, I was uh, when CPEC was launched in 2015, I was the chairman of the parliamentary committee on CPEC, involving all the political parties to take it forward. And today, uh, uh, and because of that CPEC, uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, we had a 5.8% growth rate in the first phase. 75,000 Pakistanis got job. Women empowerment in the backward and less developed areas of Pakistan, we have had women uh, driving dumper trucks, women uh, playing a very active role, and also 28,000 Pakistani students now studying in China, uh, 25,000 learning the Chinese language in Pakistan. So it has been a game changer for Pakistan, uh, eliminating the energy crisis, building up ports and highways, and now also focusing on socio-economic development, because now the focus has shifted from infrastructure and power projects to socio-economic development at the grassroots level. So the Chinese model has been very, very important, the developmental model. And that developmental model has been different than the West, because there is has been an element of also egalitarianism uh, involved in that. Uh, people talk of Jiang Zemin, uh, who was later president of China, when he was in Pakistan in 1971 as an engineer, along with a group of engineers who, who were helping us in defense production. It was a, a difference uh, between the American the US aid uh, specialist and also uh, with the Chinese. So the Chinese success story is something that we all uh, should learn from. And I think this has become a new model for developing countries. And the final thing I'd say is that on this issue of coronavirus pandemic, China has been outstanding in helping countries like Pakistan with vaccines, with personal protective equipment, and uh, uh, with uh, other sub masks, face masks, no strings attached. And I think that is a qualitative difference between China and some of our Western friends uh, who always have a political agenda behind all their support. Thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to be in uh, such august company. Thank you so much, Senator Hussein. It's been a great pleasure to listen to you. Um, now, our final speaker uh, a speaker is from the Chow Collective. And since uh, Danny, I think, sorry, Charles cannot be with us today, um, uh, 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 Carlos will play the video of his talk. Carlos, please go ahead. Uh, oh, and while Carlos is doing that, I'm going to uh, quickly introduce the Chow Collective. The Chow Collective is a volunteer collective of diaspora Chinese challenging American aggression uh, against China and other countries. It tries to be a bridge between the American left and China's Marxist and anti-imperialist thinking and practice. It tries to disrupt Western disinformation and to provide a lens into China's role in supporting an emerging bloc of independent third world countries, both who are all threatened by Western economic military and political violence. So with that, uh, Carlos, please go ahead and play the video. Hello, everyone. My name is Charles Xu, and I'm a member of Chow Collective. As our website states, we are a diaspora Chinese media collective dedicated to challenging US aggression on China. Right now, that diasporic position places me on the West Coast of the United States, where this event starts airing live at the ungodly hour of six in the morning. So that's why I'm appearing via pre-recorded video. To my fellow panelists, I look forward to watching all your presentations once I finally wake up 
and I regret not being able to have a live dialogue with you. To the organizers of this panel at Friends of Socialist China, we at Chow are deeply grateful and humbled by the opportunity to appear in such a distinguished lineup. And to our comrades in China and all those around the world who continue to stand with the Chinese revolution, we send our best wishes on this momentous occasion of the centenary of the founding of the Communist Party. Now, the reason we're all here today is not just to commemorate that anniversary. It's to discuss another milestone that China attained just in time for it, on schedule, in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, the US trade war, and all the severe economic dislocations they caused. That, of course, is the eradication of absolute poverty, which was announced last November, to moderate fanfare in China and dead silence for most Western media. In what little English language coverage I've seen, even from sympathetic sources, there are quite a few stark omissions and frankly, ahistorical narratives being propagated. So I think there's no better occasion than now. Um. One very common pitfall I've noticed is to consider the reform and opening period in isolation to treat poverty alleviation as a project limited to the post Mao period or worse somehow going against the grain of Mao era policy. Nothing could be further from the truth. That narrative erases or actively denigrates the agrarian roots of the Chinese revolution and the titanic social transformations of the first three decades of the People's Republic, which were pioneered of course in the CPC's rural base areas for the two decades preceding. To combat this line, I personally find it very useful to turn to Max Eil, who is one of the most profound and original thinkers today on the subjects of agrarian socialism and national liberation. If you allow me, I'd like to quote liberally from a Twitter thread that he posted when China officially certified the eradication of extreme poverty this past March. Quote, I have to say it makes me a little uneasy to see a lot of the pro-imperialist, uh, sorry, and anti-imperialist pro-state sovereignty left referring to China's lifting 800 million people out of poverty, using the World Bank's PPP adjusted measure, and seldom with discussion of the revolutionary pre-1978 policies. What China did from 1949 to 1978 was what was truly remarkable and set a gold standard for poverty reduction measured in regular access to use values, primary capital formation, breaking food availability constraints, spreading healthcare and education. What China did most fundamentally was redistribute the land and more or less non-coercively reorganize rural labor to continually enhance rural food and agricultural production while mobilizing people power and capital for sovereign industrialization. That was a miracle. Measured and enhanced and continually rising per capita access to fundamental use values needed for humane life and it laid the basis for later growth. What is perhaps even more important is that what China did in 1949 to 1978 is the model the rest of the poor world needs to try to follow today. Updated for our times, but shattering the export oriented agricultural model, moving to internal food sovereignty and low cost investments in health and education, and also mobilizing labor and rural surplus for industrialization. Post 1978 China offers a different kind of positive lesson about the retention of state capacity for planning and investment decisions in a far less welcoming environment as the vise tightened on third and second world national projects." End quote. Uh, the late great Samir Amin in a characteristically perceptive and prescient monthly review article entitled China 2013, also emphatically stated that Mao era developmental policies laid the foundations for China's post 1978 rise. Quote, to say as one hears ad nauseum that China's success would, should be attributed to the abandonment of Maoism whose failure was obvious. The opening to the outside and the entry of foreign capital is quite simply idiotic. The Maoist construction put in place the foundations without which the opening would not have achieved its well-known success. To say that China's success is mainly even completely attributable to the initiatives of foreign capital is no less idiotic. It is not multinational capital that built the Chinese industrial system and achieved the objectives of urbanization and the construction of infrastructure. The success is 90% attributable to the sovereign Chinese project." End quote. In other words, we must treat the elimination of poverty as a project spanning the entire sweep of revolutionary Chinese history, starting in 1949 and indeed earlier in the CPC's base areas. True, it's a project broken into two phases, 
only the second of which was explicitly framed as such as a matter of state policy. But we must hold fast to the revolutionary achievements of the first Maoist phase too. We must not discount the importance of sweeping land reform, of rural collectivization that met in most cases with the enthusiastic support of the peasantry, of securing a basic modicum of shelter, food, education, and public health as fundamental and decommodified rights. And we have to recognize that because these basic human necessities were so widely decommodified, in other words, not subject to the law of value, they do not figure into the GDP or income calculations from that period. But those social gains were no less real, no less foundational to the drive to eradicate quantitative and qualitative poverty, and no less valuable to revolutionaries today. Indeed, as Max Isle points out, they probably provide even more useful direct lessons to those waging struggles for land and human dignity in the global south, because those achievements were secured before China enjoyed, as it does today, the state capacity and economic might to discipline both foreign and domestic capital toward the ends of national development. They were the fruits of the Jiangxi Soviet, the Long March, Yan'an, and the formative struggles of the Communist Party before it took power nationally. They made possible the modern day Chinese exception to global South dependency and neocolonialism. All that said, I do have to push back gently on one of Max Isle's opening points. It's entirely true that Western coverage of recent achievements in poverty alleviation, even coming from left outlets that are broadly sympathetic to China, um, does fixate on the adjusted World Bank income threshold. Unfortunately, this framing plays directly into mainstream narratives that paint Chinese state policy initiatives as technocratic, quantitative, and top-down in nature. Now, when compared to the highly legible and highly visible and, and routine mass mobilizations of the Mao era, I do understand where this reputation comes from. But the deeply textured, deeply human, lived reality of poverty alleviation in rural China thoroughly belies this narrative. And to truly understand it on its own terms, we have to turn to detailed local accounts of the epochal transformations that have happened in everyday village life. This is where Chow Collective's own contributions come in in the form of two notable translations that we published last year. The first is the, metaphor, the Metamorphosis of Yuan Gu Dui, a moving portrait of one of the most desperately poor villages in Gansu province. At the outset in 2013, so emblematic is the village of Yuan Gu Dui of rural Chinese poverty that locals know success there would propagate all the way up the administrative hierarchy to have national significance. Families are quoted as saying, quote, if only Yuan Gu Dui could cast off poverty, and you could consider Ding Xi as having cast off poverty. If only Ding Xi could cast off poverty, then you could consider Gansu as having cast off poverty. If only Gansu could cast off poverty, then China would more or less have succeeded in truly casting off poverty, end quote. I can't fully do it justice in the time I have, but the rest of the essay covers in lyrical detail the concrete realities of poverty alleviation for the residents of Yang Gu Dui. The construction of functional roads linking the village to the nearest town, the revival and rapid completion of a long dormant aqueduct supplying potable water, the building of secure houses for over 300 households, the establishment of collective village enterprises as varied as solar power, agritourism, and sheep rearing, the overturning of patriarchal norms in cultural production. The triumph of Yang Gu Dui over absolute poverty, secured well ahead of schedule, entailed all of this and more in just six years. And that is the story that gets left out when we examine poverty alleviation through the lens of per capita income alone. Yang Gu Dui may have been something of a poster child, but many aspects of its experience were hardly atypical. This is abundantly clear from our second translation entitled, What Does It Mean to Eradicate Absolute Poverty? which includes the official criteria and procedures for delisting households, villages, and counties as being in absolute poverty. For individual households, the criteria include not just income, but also, quote, food and clothing security, access to compulsory education, guaranteed basic health care, and safe housing. This shows that the attention to qualitative use values remains undiminished in the actual implementation of poverty alleviation so too does the primacy of grassroots initiative. 
delisting of households requires the input of both the village level CPC branch and a village committee formed and governed by the local residents themselves, as well as the village as a whole. This gives a lie to Western portrayals of poverty alleviation as an act of top-down central government fiat. I wanna conclude by mentioning another common thread running through the Yuan Kudui piece in particular, which is the prevalence of martial language. Housing, transport, water, and so on are described as battlefields on which campaigns are launched against absolute poverty. Superficially, this rhetoric bears a re resemblance to, for example, the Johnson administration's stated war on poverty in the US. But as we well know, that war was launched in conjunction with other figurative wars on crime and later on drugs, as well as the very literal US war on Vietnam. As Ruth Wilson Gilmore and other abolitionists remind us, under capitalist imperialism, poverty is a structural necessity that can at best be regulated, but never eliminated by a regime of military Keynesianism or since the end of the Cold War, carceral Keynesianism. Accumulation here in the imperial core requires abject destitution, starvation, and premature death on a genocidal scale in the global South. But China's path to zero poverty shows emphatically that there is another way. In the Mao era, a Grenin revolution enabled titanic land reforms and the decommodification and universal provision of basic necessities. The reform and opening period has secured the country's economic might by conventional metrics as well, but crucially without subjecting itself or other nations to the geopolitical dominion of Western capital. In so doing, China's success creates vital breathing room for nations and people's movements in the global South to put its own revolutionary lessons into practice. In this sense, the eradication of absolute poverty is not just a fitting culmination of the Communist Party's first century of existence. It is the Chinese people's greatest gift to the world. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, I sh we are fine. First of all, I'd like to say thanks to all the panelists and all the attendees for their astonishing stamina. Now, provided there is any energy for this, and um, yes, there is Q&A time, and so we will at least take a few questions and answers. Let's say commit to a couple of rounds and see how we are doing. So if you have a question, um, if, if you would please like to raise your hands and I will, I see there are already two raised hands. So uh, there are already four raised hands. So one by one, I'm going to promote you to uh, becoming a panelist so that you can place your question yourselves. So uh, first I have Charlie April, would you please go ahead and I will promote three others and then we will have four questions and then some answers and then four more questions, if there are any. So go, please go ahead, Charlie. Hello? Yes. Oh yeah, please hi. Uh, thank you to all the panelists, uh, incredible talk. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes? Yes. Is the connection okay? Yep. Okay. Oh, yes. Uh, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it was uh, incredible, incredible talks, everybody. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first two, Dr. Padne. Um, um, just, I want to hear your thoughts a little bit on how China's historical and contemporary experience uh, in, in uh, agricultural reform and revolution informs uh, you know, can can inform or, or draw lessons to the current uh, struggle occurring in, in India. Um, and another question that's kind of a little unrelated, um, maybe for all the panelists, was uh, I wanted to kind of uh, hear thoughts or if anyone had any experience with, uh, you know, I read recently that there are, you know, beyond just party cadre, there are uh, 200 million volunteers in China at large who are non-party members. As well, so I wanted to hear kind of uh, how the war on, uh, you know, the China's war on poverty and poverty elimination campaign has also mobilized the the masses, um, the non-party, the people who are who are not not in the party. So, yeah, uh, for, for that questions for anybody. Uh, that, thank you again. That's great, Charlie. And please follow Charlie's example and keep your questions to the point and succinct. Next, I have Dale Brennan.
Uh, uh, so it's late here, so late here, so can I help light? Um, it's actually like one, two, one, it's like one in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, it's not quite. Um, my questions. I live in Sydney, uh, where essentially stuff like poverty and conditions hasn't been increasing much, right? So ultimately, how what what would you say to people who live in a situation where neoliberalism is so dominant that so ultimately what would, what would your advice be for some form of change or a evolution de- internally with systems where it, there's such institutional bias already and how would you get the spirit of the poverty alleviation in these circumstances put through and how could you apply it in, a, in such a capitalist heavy dominant society and my second question is about loans and ultimately loans do, is it do, do you think the Chinese loans will be sustainable long term in getting more investment down the line uh, compared to Western loans such as the inter- monetary fund and so on, which have very conditional and punitive and harmful after effects. And do you think Chinese loans in turn will catch on and grow in influence or decline in, in influence over time with development? And those questions can be open to anyone. Okay, great, Dale. Thank you very much. Next, I have Aiden Cross. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, my question is, um, so obviously the success of the alleviation campaign is not in denial in China itself, but the main problem is uh, kind of trying to communicate that to the rest of the world. In my, I, in my experience, when I've tried to talk about the alleviation campaign, they just say, oh, they could just be lying. That's quite difficult to argue with. Uh, Because it's kind of a blunt response and we all know the infamous example of the PBS documentary that was taken off air because of being too pro-China. So how would you say would be the most um, effective means of kind of communicating the success? Because there's a problem, especially as it was hinted at earlier, where you don't live in areas affected by poverty. You kind of just don't really consider it at all. and You don't see any success. And so obviously this success is very difficult to communicate because the the kind of anti-Chinese rhetoric has grown so much in the West, especially after the pandemic. And so effectively to the point, what would be the best way to communicate this kind of thing and overcome this sort of blanket, oh, it could just be all lies. Great, thank you. And finally, I have a question from Andre. Hello, uh, I would ask to, I would like to ask something about uh, Marxism in China because uh, I've heard that, I've re- once read that uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, made schools and universities more neutral and didn't have Marxism applied. But uh, you mentioned that there is a professor of Marxism and then, and, and I would like to know more about that relation of Marxism and schools and if that helps the the poverty alleviation program in any way. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, So um, most of the questions were for everybody, but perhaps I will begin with Utsa because one of the questions was specifically for her and then I know John would like to address the questions and if as other panelists, if you would like to come in, please raise your hand and we will go through all the panelists. So Utsa, are you here? Yeah, there you are. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, would you like to go ahead, please, uh, for, for the questions specifically for you and any other questions you want to come back to? Yeah. Uh, can you see me and hear me? Okay. Yep. Both. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think uh, basically the question, if I got it right, was... Uh, comparison of uh, agricultural uh, reform and revolution in China with uh, what happened in India. Is that right? 
Yes, that's right. So, well, so that really the relevance of the Chinese experience for India, both historical and contemporary Chinese experience for yeah, India. Yeah, well, you know, the trajectory that China followed, of course, was very different from that of India because uh, you have this uh, civil war, uh, and before this civil war, the anti-Japanese war, which was uh, led by the Communist Party, which acquired enormous prestige and so on, and uh, to which all patriots flocked, whether they were communists or not, because the top CPC was really, and the PLA was the main force which was fighting the Japanese. And after that, the successful civil war and the uh, formation of the People's Republic of China, more or less the same year as uh, the Republic of India, but which had followed a very different trajectory of uh, a handover of power by uh, the British after a long period of uh, struggle of a different kind within India. And so the resulting uh, land reform in India and China were vastly different because China had uh, land reform. Uh, Utsa, you're breaking up. Do you want to speak closer to the mic? Oh. Uh, Utsa, you were breaking up. Uh, if you would like to speak closer to the mic or without the video, maybe either either of those may work or both of those may work. Um, okay, maybe we will come back to Utsa. I, uh, Hello, can, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Go ahead, Utsa. Please go ahead. Shall I carry on? Yes. Okay. So I was saying that uh, you had a kind of a revolutionary upsurge from below in which uh, the land reform was so thorough going because it was based on village level committees deciding who was to get the land from whom. And if we see Victor Lippitt's book, we find that something like altogether 46% of the total land. Hmm. I think we will have to continue for a bit. Hopefully, Utsa, will, oh, Utsa is back. Utsa, are you back? And can you say something? Can you continue? Again and again. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know why I'm getting muted <laughs> repeatedly at my end. Maybe I think your connection, your connection is dropping out, so. Yeah, I think so, I think so. Well, let me just quickly go through. So uh, the kind of land reform you had in India was very different. It was legalistic, it was top down um, through laws enacted by the various state assemblies. And uh, I estimate that only about... Uh, Utsa, I think we should come back to you in a little while. I'm just going to go to the other speakers. Uh, yeah, Radhika, I wouldn't be able to stay on because, you know, I have my problems, as I've mentioned to you. Yeah, yeah. So let me say that, uh -huh. um, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, after that, the formation of the cooperatives and later the communes is, in my opinion, what really marks the very great difference between the Chinese and the um, Indian trajectory of We've lost you, sir. Okay, I think we will have to leave Utsa for now. So I know, John, you wanted to say something. So please go ahead and I'll message Utsa or email Utsa. Yeah, just very briefly on the question of how to explain China. This, I'm not going to give you the most scientific uh, argument, but I'll give you what's the uh, best practical illustration. Okay. If you take the famous um, problem of Eastern Europe, which did have economic failure, that wasn't a fake, and with the Berlin Wall, you can take China as the completely opposite. China has the largest foreign travel of any country in the world. 140 million... We have to give up because uh, my connection is getting interrupted very uh, repeatedly. Okay, okay so that? please Thank carry on so with the other questions, I think. Okay, okay? thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. There, 
There are 140 million foreign trips made by Chinese a year. The number of people who defect as a result is completely insignificant. In other words, the Chinese people can go out of China and what do they do? They decide to go back to China. It's very well put to me by in one of the universities I worked in. She said, look, I've got a good job. I'm able to go on foreign holidays. I've got a, a, an apartment. I'm, you know, I'm, get, I'm saving up the money to buy a car. Do they think I want to go to the United States? Because she had a problem of getting a visa to go to the US. She said, do they think I want to go to the US to wash dishes? And this is, you know, th th this is not the most scientific statistical argument, but frankly, is the illustration. With 140 million people a year, leaving 140 million trips a year, if there was any large desire to leave Ch out China, millions of people would be leaving China because there's no obstacles. So that's not the most scientific way to explain things, but it's a very good popular one. On the question of uh, Xi Jinping, it's the same on the question of, uh, or parallel to the question of Mao. The, the Western lies on the question of Mao have no impact in China, whatever literally whatever all polls all indications mao is the most revered person in china because he established national independence and he made a gigantic social improvement uh, for the people and this affected you know 20 percent of the population of the world so it has no impact but you, you it's difficult ting's knows because she's in china if you see what is happening around the 100th anniversary of the cpc it is incredible you have Marxism, you have the whole of city. They had a dress rehearsal for the celebration in Shanghai with the playing of the Internationale, uh, unbelievable laser lights, hundreds of buildings on the front put up. Uh, Xi Jinping is going to, oh, who knows exactly what he's going to say, but he's going to obviously going to reveal that the foundations of the CP is in Marxism. There is inc the, the, the largest number of Marxists and the largest number of socialists in the world by a very huge margin is in China. And that, that is a real Marxification and socialism view of what's going on. And it's very important to understand this outside. Of course, this leads to the West intensifying its attacks on China because it's horrified. 1.4 billion people praising Marx and the Communist Party is not what the West wants to hear, but it is the reality and people should understand that. That's great, John. Uh, now I have already four of the panelists who would like to address the questions and I'm going to go with them, uh, Mick, Tings, uh, uh, Roland and Danny. And, um, and I would like to say also that we've decided this will be the only round of questions we'll have because we're already at over two and a half hours and these responses will probably take us close to three hours. So sorry about that. But uh, having said that, please go ahead, Mick. Uh, the uh, Chow presentation outlined very briefly the extraordinary story of one village in Gansu province. There are many, many studies of the transformation of villages in rural China. Many of them have been studied by Chinese people. Some have been studied by foreign scholars. You know, I think, you know, these stories all need to be written up. And I think these stories have to be written up and then translated into other languages. And I think a very important question was asked, you know, how does one, in a sense, get the message out about what is actually really happening in China? And I think, you know, CGTN, Global Times are doing really an excellent job, but, you know, one ha actually has to expand the scale enormously because it's, it's quite clear, you know, that Western media does not want to publish good news about China. So there has to be another path, you know, through which I'm not just saying good news. I mean, one's looking at things that are critically engaged with the reality of what is happening. But that information, you know, is, is simply not getting out to the extent to which it ought to be. So I think, you know, there are many people here. If you could you inform yourselves, you know, take the opportunity to come here to visit, see some of these places, 
to find out what's happened to them. But also, you know, China itself has to mount a sort of media activity on a, on a much larger scale than at present, you know, to try to get information about some of the extraordinary things happening in this country in, into the wider world and to try, you know, in a sense to bypass, you know, the main Western media, because I don't think they will ever want to tell a positive story about China. And it's, it's deeply sad. It's deeply sad. Uh, thank you. Mick Tings, please go ahead. I just wanted to respond quickly on the point about the mass mobilization. And it's a, and it's a very important one. There are some aspects that almost remind member of the, the legacy of the Mao era, you know, in terms of the vast sectors of society that was brought together and not exactly, not exclusively for party members. Um, you know, their volunteers, enterprises and civil sector to give a couple examples of how it, it works. Um, so for instance, there's oftentimes a pairing of a city in the a wealthier, more developed Eastern region with a lesser developed area in the West. Um, and, and that partnership means that, you know, uh, state owned enterprises to private enterprises uh, will channel a lot of the investments to build new industries, uh, open factories, uh, agricultural production. Um, but also in, in, in kind of human resource terms, sending workers, sending technicians, teachers, and doctors to the region and spend years at a time, not necessarily party members at all. And there's also many dozens of partnerships between colleges and universities to bring students um, to the countryside, you know, whether it's helping with research, um, helping with training, or even third party evaluation of how the program is happening. And there's a, uh, I just want to share a couple really interesting points about how many medical doctors, at least uh, 118,000 medical doctors have been specifically tasked to be sent to the uh, poor areas um, to spend a good amount of time, you know, remembering back to the kind of the barefoot era of, of getting work, uh, the doctors to the countryside, but also interesting programs like uh, teacher training. So in return for your free uh, education to become a teacher, you might go teach for a two year term in a poor village. Uh, and these kinds of, 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 of structured ways of mobilizing mass society is what makes the, the kind of uh, impact of the, uh, of the program. And also I just on the point about the sort of Western media agenda is that the same misinformation also um, gets repeated in the global South, you know, uh, especially even, even among left and progressive um, because of just the lack, the, the barrenness of the media scape in terms of accessing information and news about China uh, and from Chinese perspectives. So it's definitely the biggest challenge we have ahead. Thank you. Lovely things. Thank you so much. And Danny, please go ahead. Yes, I just want to address quickly the question of how do we communicate poverty alleviation in the West, in the United States and its successes, the success of China's campaign I think there are so many aspects to hit on here, but I'll just be brief. First, it's really important that we're able to, and I think this is part of the reason why we founded Friends of Socialist China, to be able to be build, rebuild bonds um, with China and do so here in the United States and the West in a way that is relatable. And so while we can, of course, continuously do events such as these, which gives, which gives such a huge and deep uh, understanding of the facts. And we have to, of course, always confirm truth with facts. But I think also engaging in experiential knowledge, really applying that knowledge to the work that we do is, is just as important. So when we're in the United States and the West and we are opposing US aggression like with the no cold war campaign um, or whether we're just engaged in our own struggles here, um, you know, working class struggles, struggles against racism, always bringing those um, to the forefront of a more internationalist perspective is so critical. And that's what Friends of Socialist China is really trying to do. It's really trying to provide that window into what is actually going on in China building bonds with uh, the Chinese people, with their representatives, with um, you know, those who are in front, friends of Socialist China everywhere in order to uh, make China's experience more relatable because that in and of itself is a huge component of combating 
aggression, combating imperialist aggression, wherever it may be coming from. And we know that it's generally an alliance at this point with the United States and its partners. So I think that is our focus and will inform our activities from here on out. And I, I just want to definitely give many thanks to all the speakers and all the participants in this event. I think it was a, a wonderful start. Um, Roland, you want to say something? Please go ahead. Um, yes, I'm just going to answer the very specific question about the role of Marxism in um, educational institutions that was asked by Aidan. Um, I'm the first non-Chinese citizen to be appointed to a school of Marxism in a Chinese university. Um, these, it's always been important, but since the uh, reforms, educational reforms, uh, dating already from the time of Hu Jintao, but also especially uh, from earlier, uh, carried through in early in the period of Xi Jinping's tenure, um, schools of Marxism have become again the nerve centers of universities. So I'll uh, give you a small example. I'm in the School of Marxism at Dalian University of Technology. It's one of the um, uh, core research areas, particularly in uh, Marxist moral education. It had a mandate to increase its teaching staff by 100%. And uh, funding was uh, supplied. They've actually got a difficulty in filling that. There's many new appointments and also increasing student numbers. But since the emphasis on this, uh, the top students are increasingly coming into the many areas of sub-disciplines of Marxism. There's six. But it's also uh, developing into a situation, once again, where Marxism is actually the overarching framework for all academic work in a Chinese university context. So you really are at, when you're in a school of Marxism, you really are at the nerve centre of the whole university. And uh, special attention is paid to it by the university president and also the university party branch secretary. Thank you so much, Roland. And I would now like to bring matters to a close by thanking all the participants for their wonderful reflections, for, to all the attendees for their amazing stamina. And I, can, I must say, all of this underlines the importance of China today, as John was underlining, um, you know, for a while, uh, it looked as though, you know, there was a time when millions of Europeans marched under the banner of Marxism. Today, millions, a billion plus Chinese and many others march under the banner of, of Marxism. And I think that, the centrality of a historical materialist viewpoint is critical to human liberation. That's what we've been talking about today. China's uh, achievements are an enormous step forward and there is a long way to go and a long way in which China as a country, as a state will likely play a very important role so that it is very important for us to, um, uh, to, 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 to counter Western disinformation and counter Western uh, uh, aggression against China. So on that note and marking the upcoming uh, centenary of the Communist Party of China, a remarkable achievement and an institution that has remarkable achievements to its credit, I want to bring this to a close. And again, thank you all very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>